Byth representing St Jude Ward. Um, limited, limited public seating has been made available. However, this meeting is also being webcast to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. The public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. In order to uh, comply with the Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal regulations, anyone who's signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign up when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. This meeting will be live streamed. Everyone speaking via microphone will be on camera, including those making deputations. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they don't wish to be recorded. Is there anybody here who doesn't wish to be recorded? Okay, thank you very much. Um, please can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they've finished, otherwise the camera will remain on you. If there's any voting, please can members keep their hands raised clearly until the number of votes have been stated. Um, now, I would like to, um, first of all, uh, ask for introductions to be made um, around the room. I'm going to start with myself, Judith Smythe, and uh, then move on to you, Councillor Simpson. Councillor Russell Simpson, Hillsy Ward. Councillor John Smith, East Cranes Craneswater. Linda Symes, East Neen Cranes Water. Darren. <coughs> Councillor Darren Sanders, Baffins Ward. Dave Ashmore, uh, Councillor for Fratton Ward. Ian Holder, Councillor for St Thomas Ward. Uh, Cheryl Fallon Chatson, Councillor for Milton Ward. Alison. Um, Alison Harper, Democratic Services. Simon Turner, Acting Head of Development Management. I'm Kieran Laven, and I'm one of the Council's planning solicitors. Good. I'd like to suggest a change in the um, order of the agenda, if that's okay with members. I'm proposing to move item 6, 262 Chichester Road, and item 7, 260 Laburnum Grove, um, up to um, number 2 in the agenda, um, particularly as I know Simon Hill has got a uh, children's prize giving at school he needs to attend, and that seems to me quite, quite important. Um, is everybody happy with that? Otherwise, we have deputations for nearly all the applications here, and um, we'll go through the agenda otherwise as set. Chair, can I suggest if we've got no deputations for numbers two and three, we could do those at the end and therefore um, hopefully not detain people longer, members of the public, from sitting around. It might be educational for them to be here, but, um, uh, but, but none of us like school. Um, so... Could I uh, would, it, would people be happy with that? My only um, point is that these are large applications and we need to be on top of, on top of the game to uh, look at these, but we'll do it at the end of the meeting. That's fine. Thank you. Good. So we'll move um, it around in that order. Good. Okay, well, but then what I'd like to do now is to uh, clarify um, how each agenda item will be dealt with. The first thing we'll have is the... Um, officers planning application and presentation which Simon Turner will do. Secondly any deputations we allow up to 12 minutes in favour and 12 minutes objecting so if there are several of you you have to divide the time. So if there are six people you'd have two minutes each that, that sort of thing. Thirdly there'll be members questions followed by members comments and recommendations and then a planning decision will be made. I have uh, an, a number, we don't have any deputations as such, but we have um, lots, the, several of you on each um, application will be wanting to um, comment in advance. Apologies for absence. I have apologies for Councillor Atwell. Councillor Holder is attending as his deputy. Apologies for George Fielding. Any other apologies? And I'm standing in for Councillor Hugh Mason. Apologies for Hugh Mason and you're standing in. Thank you. Any more? Thank you very much indeed. Good. Sometimes we have uh, gen general comments um, and so forth at the beginning of the meeting. Um, are there any comments from uh, you, Simon, at the beginning of this meeting? No? Okay. 
So I'd like to move on then to the, de the um, declaration of members' interests. And just to get us started, I have a personal but uh, non-prejudicial uh, and non-financial interest in the application for Flat House Key because I'm your rep the council's, one of the council's representatives on the Port Advisory Board. Councillor Sanders. Um, thank you, Judith. I have a personal but not prejudicial interest in the two HMO applications as I live in a HMO, so the perception would be that I would look at it one way or the other, you know, I won't. With regards to the St. Michael's Lodge application, I realise that the ownership is in, it's in the ownership of the council. However, I was informed yesterday that there is a ransom strip nearby which belongs to the housing revenue account, uh, which I'm legally responsible for. Um, and as such, um, if this were to go through, that account would materially benefit that account. So if, if it goes through, essentially the housing revenue account would financially benefit. Now, I don't think that affects my judgment in terms of my view of this application. But Kieran, um, it, it, it will be interesting. I think there may be a public perception issue. Yeah, that's correct. This is something I've, I was expecting you to say. Um, so I've looked at it and under the Code of Conduct, because your land holding originates from your function as a cabinet member, it doesn't hit the personal threshold and therefore it doesn't also hit the prejudicial uh, threshold under the Code of Conduct. However, separate to that, as you've already identified, are issues of uh, the perception of bias and predetermination and whether or not the reasonable person possessed of all the facts would perceive you to have a, a bias or a predetermination. So with the Nolan principles in mind, it's a decision for you on that basis. Do you want to sit on this application? Um, I think that the, if this were to go, if, if people were to, to go with the officer's recommendation, I would vote with the officer's recommendation. I think that there will be people locally, many of whom are council tenants, um, who would believe that um, it would not won't be true, but who would believe that I did it because we will get money. And it puts you in the horrible position I of trying to understand the reason for that asking. position. Yes. Um, it, it isn't personal money, it's public. It's for public good, isn't it? Um, I, I would agree with that, but the issue is uh, I, I don't think there's anything to stop me. I think but you the can perception... sit on it and it's defensible, um, but ultimately it's your choice. I mean, my view is it would not affect my view of this, mm. this application. Yes, mm. I think that's legitimate. Yeah. Okay, but I would be foolish for not raising it. Yes, certainly. You're right to raise it. Okay. Thank you very much for your clarity. I think openness is all, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the solicitor will tell you that we have to step out of the room. Gerald. Um, I have two applications where I need to declare an interest which are personal well, which I think neither means I have to leave. Um, the first is St. Michael's Lodge, um, because I own one of the flats on Flint Street, um, which isn't referred to in the report, um, and I can't identify from the report which block has been renamed Flint Street, which, which is, but ha is not correctly identified, um, because we don't get pensions in this job, that is my pension. Um, so I will leave, but I'm going to do a deputation um, beforehand. And then as cabinet member with responsibility for the port, I can't be here for the one <coughs> uh, about Flat House Key. And again, I'm not going to do a deputation on that. Um, I, I will leave for both of those. And for the explanation of the public, your position is different from mine in that regard, because be you're on the decision making board and I'm on the advisory board. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, just, just to let you know up front, I'll have to be, I'll have to leave about half one-ish. That's the latest I can do. But also to seek some advice on uh, when it comes to item eight, Lakeside. Um, I was the cabinet member um, for the environment thing and was very supportive of this going through. Although the process obviously didn't lie within my uh, portfolio at the time, and I'm no longer a cabinet member now. So seeking advice on what to do with that, please. You said something that pricked my ears up in terms of possible predetermination. Um, you said you were supportive of it or something to that effect. Um, to, do you consider yourself to have made statements that would give, again, the reasonable person possessed of all the facts the impression that you are particularly one way or the other on this application? You have. In that case, then I would suggest you step out for the benefit of predetermination avoidance. Yep. Thank you. 
Okay, well, I will... Um, re when Chair, we re stop, stop. just to let you know, I need to leave about one o'clock. Yeah. Good. Thank you, very, thank you all very much. We'll reorder the agenda so that um, item five comes at the very end, so that if Dave has to leave, then um, we will... Uh, he, he can go. <laughs> and not come back. And... Um, <laughs> And we'll proceed um, now by starting with St. Michael's Lodge, um, item number one. I uh, know we need to do, approve the minutes. I'm very sorry. We've got the uh, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 28th of September, page 5 to 16 of this report. Um, and I recommend they're approved as a correct record, but I'll go through them quickly to make sure. Page 5, 6, 7... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Is it okay with you all if I sign them as a correct record? Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move on to the first item on the agenda, which is ex St. Michael's Lodge. Um, and ask Simon to introduce this to us in the usual way. Please. Thank you, Chair. I'll take you through the presentation the normal way, and then afterwards uh, there are some supplementary matters, the SMAT report, uh, and then some deputations. This is an application on the former St. Michael's Lodge, a former care home, uh, bounded by Silver Street, Stone, Stone Street and Gold Street in Southsea for the development of 18 dwellings. Just to, to locate everyone, the red uh, label in the middle of the screen there locates the site. It's just to the east of that, the, the greener area you can see, Stone Street written uh, on the right-hand side, the eastern side. So we are south of the city centre, but close to the city centre, just south of the King's Road there. Uh, Castle Road is just to the southeast. You can see the South Sea Common there to the south. Uh, the museum is just to the northwest. So you're in the middle there of uh, Western South Sea, close to the city centre uh, and Old Portsmouth and so on. So highly sustainable location, I should add right from the start with respect to access to jobs in the city centre, in Gun Wharf, uh, naval base, uh, the commercial port, etc., etc., and the range of shops and leisure distributed around the area in various locations, close and uh, nearby close as well, uh, and public transport, of course, as well, with buses and trains and ferries. There's the application site in a bit more detail, red-edged for you. So the, uh, the access is off uh, Diamond Street, which is just there to the west, um, around the back of some uh, residential properties and some garages you can see there and the site opens out uh, fronting Silver Street to the north, Stone Street to the east and uh, uh, Gold Street to the south. You can make out some of the bigger trees there uh, that I'll show you in a minute. This is from the uh, north east corner of the site looking southwest across the site so that is Silver Street on the right hand side going away into the distance and then Stone Street on the left hand side there. So that is the site in front of you behind the trees and so on. Um, you can make out in white uh, on the right hand side uh, a former warehouse stroke commercial building that's converted into a house now which is dealt with in the report. Um, some of the trees there, um, a dead or dying tree on the right hand side uh, fronting Silver Street and on the left hand side uh, the rather lovely um, white bean tree, which is one of the protected trees. Hornbeam, sorry. That's almost the same view, just move, looking slightly to the uh, right, so you get a direct view down uh, Silver Street. We've shown that one so you can get an idea of the surrounding context. The three-storey... Um, council or former council flats, uh, typical of this area, this, this enclave, rather attractive, quiet enclave despite its very central location. Three-storey masonry uh, flats, well designed, post-war I think, um, with well-maintained landscape gardens to the front. That is, in a nutshell, the prevailing character, with some on-street parking as you can see. This is looking the, the, the site is there on the left-hand side. This is looking north along Stone Street. 
Um, so you can see some more frontage trees, uh, Scots pine there on the corner, just sticking above the rest, that's one of the protected trees, covered in ivy, um, and there's a short-term, non-permanent um, Harris fencing around the front, or chain link fencing. Slightly wider view, uh, looking therefore west along Gold Street. That is the Gold Street frontage, or part of it. Um, there's a larger building fronting the terraces uh, on the left-hand side, and then the building in the middle is uh, a building fronting Stone Street, uh, which has some secondary kitchen windows you can just make out on its flank wall, uh, which would be uh, next to the flank wall of the proposed development. Uh, the big tree behind is also a rather magnificent hornbeam part of the uh, protected trees that would uh, remain. Here's the site layout. <coughs> so there is the access of Diamond Street. Uh, this is the St. Jude's uh, Children's Day Nursery. Uh, they have objected with respect to their fire exit out onto the back there. This is the former warehouse commercial building I mentioned earlier that's converted into a house. And these are flats fronting Gold Street. have a front door there, a back door there. This area actually is not shown on here as a mixture of uh, it was a back door, path, and um, refuse stores, built refuse stores. So uh, I mentioned the character of the area a few moments ago of, of three-story development set back behind landscape. This is essentially what this development seeks to replicate. You can see the frontages there uh, of retained and new landscaping. Um, and I'll take you through all the trees in a moment. Before I forget, the site is currently, it has been long vacant. Um, the former care home was demolished long ago, and uh, the site has not been productively used since. Um, it is currently in use for construction workers parking, a sort of compound for the nearby Hambrook House development that some members may recall, just to the immediate south that is nearing con uh, completion of construction. So those, uh, those, those construction parking will disappear early next year. Uh, and then also in the southeast corner of the site is the uh, temporary mobile phone mast and kit um, that is an emergency situation, emergency inverted commas, that's the legislation that allows for temporary siting um, in order to continue network coverage when something else happens and the site has to terminate and a, a new permanent site is not yet found. That is a temporary situation. So we have um, 18 dwellings, six flats, that would be affordable housing and uh, 12 houses. These are houses, a mixture of terraces and detached on each corner. More houses here, three and, three and four bedroomed, the fourth bedroom in the roof space in these purple houses. Um, and then the three story block of flats, six that would be affordable housing. The trees on the front, the bigger specimens, there's the first horn beam that I showed you on Stone Street, the one that almost creates a tunnel uh, through the road, uh, the road underneath it being kept, and the second fine specimen by the access there will be kept, and then the darker trees are also other trees to be kept, and then some removals. I'll take you through those in a bit more detail. And the landscape frontages. A bit of on-street parking at the front. In the SMAT, um, I'll come to that right now since we're here, um, this last parking space um, we've agreed with the applicant that would be better off actually post-publication to be landscape space, a uh, better finish to the site frontage adjacent to the flank wall of the house. So that's one change. And then the access in from Diamond Street opens out into a shared parking area with bits of landscaping and then uh, garage, garages off the back into all the houses. And one or two have front garages there and there. That, in a nutshell, shows you the development uh, in plan form. Elevations, a um, little bit hard to read, perhaps. This is the Silver Street elevation, so that is the warehouse converted to a house. These are the three-storey uh, flats. Forgive me if it's hard from this angle. Stone Street, this is the eastern elevation. So here's the terrace of three-storey houses, with some of them using roof space for an extra bedroom. And then the southern elevation along Gold Street as the corner property detached 
little terrace and a pair there and this is the existing property fronting Gold Street. Um, so the three stories accord with uh, local characters you can see for example here and from the photos I've shown you um, mostly masonry, townhouses and then uh, a render covered uh, building on the uh, northern elevation for the flats. A bit more detail this is the eastern elevation facing Stone Street uh, so you can get a bit of a bit more of a feel for the uh, townhouse type approach there's the roof space uh, extra bedroom and then at the rear dormer accommodation there um, here are the garages and then the living areas are open plan on the first floor to the houses so that everyone has got this walkout generously sized individual terrace um, as their private amenity area uh, should you want something more, you can just nick down to uh, Ravelin Park or Victoria Park or to South Sea Common. Uh, these are the upper floors. Not much more to show you other than I've described. They're the open plan um, first floors with shown in green, um, the, the, the rooftop terraces. We've got by condition of privacy screen on this one just to make sure privacy is maintained to the uh, adjacent existing property on the corner of Gold Street and the western one. Um, and just some more floor layouts, should anyone wish to see them in due course, I've also got the flats as well. Uh, so that, in summary, I'll keep it on the um, layout, is, is the development for you. Um, parking, I should mention, um, apart from the garages, individual garages to the houses, um, external parking um, in accordance with your standards even after taking out the one space I mentioned there. Uh, if I may then move on to the uh, SMAT. Uh, the ownership was mentioned earlier. We, we did know the site was in council ownership or at least that was shown by the certificate. The application is two years old so we didn't want to publish something without being absolutely certain so we checked before and post publication on ownership uh, and it is still in the council's ownership so that's just there for completeness as we would normally have that in the printed report. Uh, the trees as we say here the we just need a bit of clarification for you on the an augmentation indeed for the site's trees. Um, the site is covered by a tree preservation order it's quite an old one and quite a few of the trees either have deteriorated or have disappeared since uh, some of them weren't big to start with I must say. So to be very clear for you, uh, the white beam excuse me, it is hard for me there is uh, that has extensive fungal fruiting bodies so that's on its way out uh, that's why there's no objection for that one coming up but th these are all trees in the preservation order just to be clear. Uh, T5 next to it is an ash that is dead. T7 there is an ash that has extensive dieback. It's on its way out. T8 and T9 were here, not big trees. There was a mountain ash or rowan that's not there anymore. Um, from Street View, that seems to have been missing for the last 10 years or so. T9 next to it was a bay that's been gone for more than 15 years we've noted uh, and lastly T13 which is that one is another ash uh, one stem is dead it's in low vigor unfortunately it's probably on its way out being an ash with other trees in the area affected by ash dieback um, so we want to clarify that but uh, the, the very best specimens are retained in particular the, the hornbeam and whitebeam are mentioned and the Scots pine and there is good room for replacement planting uh, trees and shrubs in the front gardens. So that was just clarification for you members. Uh, turning to the uh, front gardens and trees, um, we wanted to make absolutely sure the character of the area was retained for aesthetic character reasons like the houses uh, around, um, the, the flats around, they've got well maintained mature communal front gardens. These may not be communal if and when they're granted planning permission 
but we wanted a communal uh, effect and we certainly didn't want either uh, hard standings and accesses and removal of front boundaries um, for cars or for any other aesthetic choice, um, not least to, to avoid root damage to the landscaping that goes in and the uh, preserved trees. So we have got uh, two conditions in the appendix, one quite lengthy but important conditions to properly control that matter into the future. Then the sustainable construction condition, that was simply omitted, apologies, uh, we've put that in there. Also an architectural detailing condition to make sure that the quality of architecture um, is, is there. So some more details of things like window reveals, uh, parapets, that sort of thing to make sure the quality is there because it is, as I said, an, an attractive enclave. And then the last matter there I mentioned already about the removal of one parking bay agreed with the applicant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now come to um, questions from members. Um, no, deputations. I'm so sorry. First of all, deputations, any order in which you want to go? Do you want to go first? Well, as I'm doing both of them. Oh, no, I'm doing. I'm, 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 no, probably we should, do we normally hear from the applicant first or the objectors first? I can't remember. We normally hear from uh, objectors first. Yes. Okay, so if I do both the objecting ones. That will be fine, and then I'll go. To, have, I got, have I got people in, in the. Are you here for this? No? You're here for it. Okay. Would you mind if Councillor Van Jackson went first, then I'll come to you. So for the first one I read from Councillor Atwell's deputation. Um, Chair, it's with regret I'm unable to be there in person today to give this deputation in respect of the former St Michael's Lodge planning application. As elected members, it's our great privilege to serve those we represent and to do everything we can to improve the quality of life of those we represent. If this planning application is approved today by this committee, we will be doing quite the opposite. This is a major development needs to be looked needs to be as good as it can be. It's clear from the number of representations that local people, those most impacted, do not believe this development to be as good as it can be, and I agree. In this deputation, I want to focus on the impact on residential amenity. Paragraph 6.20 in the report talks about the objections received referring to the potential um, for loss of light and overlooking. Paragraph 6.21 then confirms that the proposal will result in a loss of light and overlooking. The residential units, quoting, the residential units proposed would abut the former warehouse to the west and the blocks of 14 to 20 Gold Street and have a front to front relationship with the apartment block uh, from that front Silver Street, Stone Street and, and Gold Street. Overlooking and loss of light are of course material planning considerations. In addition to the re report seemingly confirming overlooking and loss of light, the language used in successive paragraphs continues to raise concern about the application. Paragraph 6.22 talks about there being unlikely uh, material loss of privacy to the occupants of the warehouse. 6.25 says it's unlikely the Silver Street apartments would be impacted in terms of loss of light, apart from perhaps in deepest winter. Paragraph 6.27 says we have another perhaps in respect of loss of sunlight and another unlikely material impact, this time in respect of Strone Street apartments. Paragraph 6.31 says it's, there are more unlikely impacts about light received as well as the acknowledgement that some morning sunlight will be blocked in respect of Gold Street. Paragraph 6.32 uh, acknowledges there would be potential to overlook into the gardens in Gold Street. Paragraph 6.32 also suggests 1.8 metre obscure, obscure screen would ensure there's no harmful loss of privacy which acknowledges there will be loss of privacy. Finally, 6.33 again also refers back to being an unlikely material impact. At best, this report suggests a great deal of uncertainty for residents and it, would do, and it should do the same for the committee. I know members will, as with all applications that come to the committee, consider this matter with a great deal of care and attention. That's the end of Chris Atwell's deputation. Thank you very much. Do you want to give your own now? Yes, if and I could, then, if that's uh, all right. You're going to withdraw at that point. Yeah. Yep, so Chair. Um, I've been asked 
by local residents to bring up two issues and then I've got one major concern myself. The concerns um, from local residents on um, Silver Street is that there are the parking spaces that are going to access onto Silver Street um, and that four times a day that's incredibly busy with parents dropping off kids and collecting kids from the nursery and they're concerned that cars backing in and out of those will be very dangerous when there, there are cars all over that, that stretch and it's not a wide road. The second bit of concern is around Diamond Street which is the potential access. By putting the access there there'll be the loss of three on-street car parking spaces which are not referred to in the report. So this is a material loss to the local community of three car parking spaces that local residents can use. And yet we're putting in a, an application where my expectation is that people living here will be able to apply for residence car parking permits and therefore add to the problem of car parking while the council has made this worse if we count this planning application by taking away on-street car parking spaces. My real concern though is in relation to the block which is deemed as 14 to 20 Gold Street which isn't but, but it's the block at the southwest corner here in grey and how close that other block is to it. My understanding is it's 1.8 metres away, we'll have a blank three-storey three wall while there are windows on that side. They're not they're secondary windows but they're windows and um, that's going to block daytime light coming into those apartments. So PCS 23 I think is clear that we need to, uh, we, we need to look at the amenity and this would be uh, and completely un without any doubt a significant loss of light to those apartments and having a blank wall 1.8 meters away from where you're living is a very big change to people's lives. If, if this was, had been there before, fine, but listen, this is our job is to look at things that are, are coming forward and new. If that, I think this is not a bad application at all, except that one block in the southwest, so close to an existing block, is just too much because of the huge impact that's going to have on the people who live in that block. So, I, 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 I don't think it's a bad, I, I, I would hope that, um, that the, the committee turns this down and says to the developer, come back without that bit, that final block right 1.8 metres away from people's windows, come back without that and then we'd be happy and, and look at addressing the parking issue of the lots of three parking spaces. But, but uh, I, I don't want to damn this out of hand because I think they've actually done a pretty good job. I just think it's just pushing it a bit much in terms of those people who live in that block. And uh, if this was a private block, there would probably be people up in arms, but this is a council block and actually we have a responsibility to everybody and we shouldn't just say, okay, it's a council block, we don't care it's okay to take their light away. Thank you, Chair. I shall now abandon you. Thank you very much. We'll uh, call you back when uh, we finish this item. Thank you. Uh, would you like to um, speak uh, um, on this application? Please. Um, Stuart Bowden from PWP Architects, Agents for the Applicant. Thanks for the opportunity to speak in favour of the application. We're grateful for the help and support we've received from officers throughout the application. Um, like the extant four-storey care home which would, had a material start on site and I think uh, in fairness to the applicant, the officer could have made um, some mention of that because there is a taller um, building which has permission and that would have occupied pretty much the, the same sort of footprint of the site um, and that is something that needs to be considered in, in determining this application. But we have retained the mature planting around the edge of the site, like the officer said. While this planting has become a little unkempt over the recent years, the TPOs that are there 
remain healthy and further good management will only benefit the site and the wider community. The number of units proposed was originally 20 and this was reduced down to 18 units proposed today. As is stated in the planning report, this number represents a dwellings per hectare figure of 60. We, can see, we consider that this is a reasonable figure for a city central location. Uh, the full complement of parking spaces required by the Council's Highways Officer has been met with all parking being contained within the site. During the initial pre-app in 2016 to 2017, planning officers preferred the Diamond Street entrance as this would leave the narrow streets of Silver Street, Gold Street and Stone Street unaffected. The applicant is offering six affordable units on site and members will be aware that this is sometimes a rarity. We are care we've carefully read the objectors' comments and have made a detailed response on each point raised and this has been on the Council's website since May this year. I would like to stress that the 5G mast that now occupies the southeast corner of the site was hostilely forced upon the client by the telephone company in question through the High Court and we take no responsibility for it being there. Fortunately, as confirmed by the planning officer's report, this is temporary. This is a brownfield site and needs to be developed to help fulfil the Council's housing numbers. The applicant has made a considered choice to pursue a development of mainly houses instead of all flats and this will reduce the impact on neighbours especially as all the parking is within the site. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's, is there anybody else speaking on this application? No. Okay, well then I'll move to ask members uh, to um, ask questions. Linda. Um, yes, I really wanted to know the two blocks that are at the other end of the um, of the application site. The, the, the land between those doesn't seem too great either, and the road going across. I can't understand why the objection to that one, when the others seem to be equally close to each other. Is that right, or is it just a misconception on my part? Simon. Perhaps while you're answering that, you could uh, address the actual distance between the two blocks in the south southeast corner as well, and what what is on the on that ele elevation. The council doesn't have the benefit of a pointer, but I, I want to understand the question: Are you comparing this d distance separation, councillor, between the nursery and the flats, and the separation between yeah, yeah. the frontages? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, this, this separation is to do with the, uh, the street, which has been there for X years. Um, I, I mean, I can answer the question that was raised in, in Councillor Vernon Jackson's deputation um, about the, uh, well, <laughs> all the immunity points. You probably want to hear me answer to Councillor Atwell and Councillor Jackson. So, shall I do that? And hopefully, that will uh, cover your point, Councillor Symes. Um, right. In general terms, uh, the, the case officer has commendably gone through in detail on page 25 and 26 the relationship between each and every surrounding block and the proposed development. He could have been briefer, um, but he's gone through it in, in great detail. Um, I think the uh, deputation has been somewhat overplayed in, in picking apart the language um, in the report. We, we choose our words very carefully. In the absence of any daylight or sunlight shadowing uh, formal technical reports, we can't say for how long uh, a deep uh, shadow from uh, at the end of the day in winter might cast a bit of shadow across the front of a, another property. We haven't asked the applicant to do that because the effects are obviously so minor. Um, so that's why we've made qualifying statements about we believe it will be minor and likely to be and so on. Um, and that's the case. The officer has, has dealt with these issues uh, for each element. Um, with respect to the warehouse, uh, uh, the conversion into the house, that the only outdoor amenity they've got is uh, a second floor terrace there. 
um, and we talked about the relationship from the second floor window here, it would be uh, very unlikely to cause any material loss of privacy for the existing second floor terrace, apart from possibly in that, that corner there. Um, they could sit on a slightly different part of their terrace. Um, so we don't feel that is a, a concern. The officer report talks about the amenity of the flats opposite on Silver Street, and we mentioned potentially in the depths of winter, the sun at a very low angle coming across might throw a bit of shadow across as far as the street. But um, even if that happens, it's for a limited amount of time. You're in the urban area. You can expect some change when a site is redeveloped. And in general terms, this is a three-story development opposite three-story flats. Um, so the relationships are perfectly acceptable and expected. The same thing was raised um, with the Stone Street development in the depths of winter. Sun, if it gets round to the west, it probably doesn't get far enough round to throw any shadow across um, to hit the front of these properties. So, you know, immaterial uh, effect. Um, we did deal in more detail about this relationship. Um, that is a ground floor uh, element. Um, so generally acceptable with respect to the communal rear of um, these flats. As I said earlier, that is not a nice landscaped garden there. That is a back access, a back, uh, back door pathway and refuse stores built there. So the ground floor relationship is not deemed to be difficult. And then at first floor level, as I mentioned earlier, the, we have a, a terrace that, uh, you know, first floor sitting out area that could overlook into windows at an angle or into that pathway. We thought it prudent rather than highly necessary to have a privacy screen there. So that secured that relationship. Um, with respect to the secondary uh, window, thank you, Councillor Vernon Jackson, for that. Um, as we say, we believe it's a second, secondary window with the other window in the kitchen facing, sorry for my moving point, um, facing north there. So it is a secondary window, so it has to be afforded somewhat less protection. Um, so yes, it would have a new block outside that window. So that particular window would lose light uh, in, into the room and there'd be a loss of outlook. But because it's a secondary window, it's difficult for the local planning authority to resist development next door. Um, looking at the wider pattern of development, <coughs> these properties are broadly speaking some of the repeat typologies. And so there are other ones that have the same situation where there's a rear window to a kitchen and the same room has a side facing window and you've got similar relationships there's some slight staggerings of building lines but there are similar relationships of gable to gable with a secondary kitchen window that would be the same here so for those reasons we didn't feel there was any reason to withhold consent or, or ask for an amendment with respect to that particular relationship by a secondary window you mean a smaller one that isn't the one that you'd look out at the view it's it's a it's a well, you could, I mean, uh, you, you could look out of it, of course, and there may even be a kitchen sink or something there, but um, you could look out of it, and at the moment, um, you'd look over a site that's a derelict site. Um, in the past, I don't know the position of the, uh, Mr. Bone referred to the four-story care home, um, the extant permission. Um, I don't know the position of that, but uh, what I'm saying is, showing you the other photographs of the area, is you can reason expect in the urban area, and particularly here, to have blocks of flats of three stories sited next to each other of the same typology. Um, so that is what is actually proposed. So I hope that picks up the general relationships between uh, the neighbours and, and the uh, proposed development. <coughs> Uh, with respect to Diamond Street and the parking, um, yes, it's, there are three on-street parking bays there. Clearly they'd have to come out uh, in order to gain access to the site because you can't get past them. I don't think, or not satisfactorily, with cars coming in and out. Um, so they would have to be, uh, well, they'd have to be removed. That would require separate consent, I imagine, uh, a section a legal agreement with the highways department. Um, the, the site provides a good level of parking, but I think the concern was the loss of three parking bays for, for local residents. Um, I surveyed this area two years ago uh, when the Hambrook House development just to the south was being developed and I was surprised at how much on-street parking there was. Um, this, uh, well, I don't think conditions were particularly different at that time with respect to COVID and so on. I passed by on Sunday evening when you can reasonably expect during term time most people to be at home and a reasonable reflection of normal parking and there were six parking bays, spaces I should say, on street, uh, mostly along Stone Street and Gold Street from recollection. 
So uh, residents may not agree with me. From what I saw on site on the Sunday um, evening, there, there was at that point anyway some on-street capacity, um, for example, to, uh, to mitigate for the loss of three spaces there. So again, we, uh, the highways department have, have not asked us to withhold permission or amend the application anyway with respect to the Diamond Street parking. I think I've answered those points. I have one other question, if you're happy with that, uh, Linda. I, I um, wanted to know the details of the extent planning application for, for what I think is a four-storey building there. What was the rough footprint? I'm sorry, Councillor, we didn't look at that. I didn't know if it was or not extant. Mr. Bone thinks it is. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. But, but clearly, would that be something that an inspector would take into account if there was a problem with it? If it were extant, which means it was implemented correctly and lawfully at the time, um, but not just progressed, that's, that's, that's establishing case law, um, it could be implemented at any time in the future. Um, and uh, yes, so the ins an inspector or the local planning authority would take that into account. Uh, but I hope in any event, whatever the position of that care home, um, I've, I've explained our position with respect to the proposed development. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. Um, it was, I mentioned in one of the deputations that Diamond Street was chosen as the entrance to relieve pressure on the smaller streets around. Diamond Street's the smallest street in that area. Was that, were any other entrances considered? I think there are already existing entrances on Gold Street, probably the largest one, with no parking spaces opposite. Why wasn't that considered? Um, yeah, the, the applicant there was referring to pre-application discussions. Um, I think because the streets have generally on-street parking on one side, um, and I noticed on site, for example, I think the previous site access, or one of them was here, and that meant there's no on-street parking opposite, just to give a bit more manoeuvring space to get on and off the site. So I think what Mr. Bone was saying, the applicant, the agent, is that if, um, if a site access had come in off one of the frontages, that would have had some sort of impact on the on-street parking. Um, more or less than the Diamond Street, I don't know, but I, I, I would, you know, we support the Diamond Street access because A, it's existing, and B, it means that um, we can have a development that fronts the public realm um, and is also secure, so subject to boundary treatments, just little fences or railings between each property, which we've discussed with the applicant, um, and subject to some sort of gate across the back, the rear of the site will be private and secure, which is always a desirable um, aim for any development in terms of just personal and property security and amenity. I thought the Diamond Street wasn't a currently an existing access because that's the land that Councillor Sanders mentioned earlier that has to be bought. Uh, yeah, it goes as far as about there uh, and then there was a, a parcel of land that is associated with the block of flats here that would have to be uh, used to get across into the site. So it's a new yes, access. So, yeah. Well, it's an extension of the existing access. You'd need a new bit of road to get into the site. Yeah. Councillor Sanders. Uh, thank you, Judith. Simon, thank you very much for this um, presentation uh, and discussion. You've answered several of my points, but sadly not all of them. Um, the first is, with regards to the loss of the three on-street parking spaces in Diamond Street, where else would they go? Would they go anywhere else in this area? Could they go anywhere else in this area? Um, well, um, the answer is no. Is no. It depends on the capacity and the size of that particular permit zone. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. I don't know how wide in, in extent that area is, um, and how far they they would have the opportunity to look for other parking spaces. I can just refer you to my previous answer about the capacity that I saw on one recent visit and a couple of years ago as well. Thank you for that. Also, uh, I mean, several of the objections revolve around people looking for parking spaces. The, I mean, I've been around these roads more than once, um, and these are really narrow roads. There is some council parking towards the rear of some of the, the blocks towards the northeast, um, but these roads are really, really narrow. The, um, is there some way in which we can say that the um, occupants of the site just basically answered our parking permits in the nearby parking zone? Hoping the answer is yes. Uh, that would be a question for the Highways Authority. Um, 
uh, and this is why I suppose this development uh, has more parking than one might have expected for a sustainable location. You know, 32 bays for 18 houses is pretty good in a city centre location, edge of city centre location. Um, as to whether or not the um, owners, if someone had two bays and wanted a third parking bay or on street ability, um, I believe they're entitled to apply to the highways authority and the highways authority would consider that. But that's outside of planning. So, that's so we can't, you're saying that if we were to put in a condition to say that the residents of this development just basically don't have access to the nearby parking zone, you're saying no. I, I, I think there's been case law around this sort of thing, and the answer to that is, it, from case law, I believe is no, and also it would strike me as a contrary position to the, the position of the Highways Authority. So. Um, all I would say is there is a good level of parking with this development. Um, the affordable housing may have that controlled through the Housing Association or City Council for the six of the units, and then you've got 12 more units and um, 32 in total parking spaces. So there is a good level of provision. I would hope not too many people would want to have more than two cars. I'm not going there. I really am not. But thank you, thank you for that, Simon. Hope springs eternal, as always. Um, the, the other, the other two issues I have um, are the one around the role of the Diamond Street Nursery. Now, I know in your report basically says there's not a problem, um, but I think if the nursery says there's a problem, there's a problem. Is there any way in which that problem can be resolved? Again. Um I'm glad they raised it because obviously it's an interest and importance. Um, and clearly the nursery has uh, made use of Diamond Street because it doesn't go anywhere. Um, apart from the free parking, the free parking bays, there's no traffic, yeah. so to speak. Um, the level of traffic with this development um, would be low uh, and infrequent and slow. Um, it ought to be coming in and out. There are corners and so on. So um, on the odd occasion of a fire drill, or actual fire emergency escape, um, the nursery will need to, to make alternative arrangements, basically. Um, I wouldn't want to say how that could be done. I don't have any expertise in that area, but they'd need to work that out. Pr primarily, I would have thought with the City Council, if the garage block is um, presumably City Council owned, um, uh, this is where I'm putting myself, uh, my, my head on the block, but um, I would have thought uh, that some aspect of the forecourt here could be used literally a couple of yards around the corner for, for the gathering of the children. But that, that is something I, I don't know, and that would have to be worked out. But it, it's not a reason, in the, in the officer's opinion, to withhold planning consent. OK. So what you're saying is that the, the objection of the nursery outlined in Section 5 is correct, because they wouldn't be able to gather. Okay. Um, but that your view is that there may be some other way of fixing it effectively. So I'm, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Yeah, um, I, I suspect it's they're actually gathering wrong. on the highway, but clearly it's a highway that doesn't go anywhere. So if there are three par cars parked there and there's a drill or a, a evacuation, um, the, the nursery knows there's going to be no vehicles coming or going, or they'd see someone get into a parked car. So they're probably on the pavement and or the actual street, the road, right. um, existing. But um, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that, I'm sure, with... Uh, the, the development next to it. So I, I think they would need to find an alternative situation on one of the pavements and or the, the forecourt of the parking bays around the corner. But that's something for them to, I, to work out. Is there any reason why they couldn't have an arrangement to, um, on the rare occasions of a fire emergency, park in the car park of the development? And that's the sort of thing you envisage, is making a, a, some sort of arrangement with neighbours. Well, well, um, well, indeed, or I, I don't know, again, I'm speculating, or I don't want to speculate much, but um, they, they've got their own land as well at the rear. I don't know what the requirements are in terms of getting out of the building or off the site and so on. Um, you know, that's something they'd have to work out with, with the fire services, with the highways department. But as I say, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I don't think it's anything that should, should withhold the granting of a planning consent. Um, thank you, Simon. My final question is around the, the local residents talk about the loss of green space and trees. The trees is in front of us, so that's fine. But with green, the green space, at the moment, can anybody access the green space behind the fences? I think I know the answer to this question, but I don't know the answer to this question. Yeah, um, no, uh, no, the site is, unless there's a hole in the fence somewhere that I didn't notice, the site is fenced off. No, I haven't found a hole in the fence either. Um, thank you for that, Simon. Those are all my questions, Judith. Thank you very much, Darren. Any further questions? Shall we move on to comments? 
Um, just a little comment from me. It's very nice to see affordable housing in a, in a development. Russell. Looking at this overall, I think it, what Councillor Gerald Van Jackson said earlier was that there's elements that are definitely to be praised. Um, however, some of the buildings, especially on the Gold Street there, is hideously close to um, property or to flats that are already there. Um, I think also I'm a bit surprised really that one can assume that if Diamond Street will be busy or not, we don't know who will actually buy these properties. It could be, it could be a, a, a couple that are taxi drivers and you've got cars coming back and forth, back and forth. So to presume that that won't be busy and there might be a fire point for children, I think is really reckless. Um, I would like to have thought the developer has talked or liaised or worked with the nursery to try and make that there's a, a, a safe point for them. But I have a funny feeling this, there is elements of this where it's been as crammed as much as possible. Um, one could argue that even though I don't know if they would be affordable, but maybe bungalows might actually be better ideas. They won't be as high, so they won't take away people's height. But once again, maybe <laughs> you know, affordable housing is a bit of a dreamer in that sense. But I think overall, if this is refused today, go back to the drawing board and just maybe take some considerations for the things that have been raised. I don't think you get this many people um, getting together to go against it if there wasn't real valid reasons. Thank you, Judith. John. Um, I, I see it slightly different. I think we need housing. I think it's been well thought out. Um, it's a brownfield site and it's going to be developed, which has got to be a good thing. We need affordable housing. How many times have we seen that affordable housing doesn't get built on the site? It's very good that it's going to get built here. The parking is met. I take the points that have been made about the loss of um, parking on the street, but um, <clears throat> I sort of know the area as well. And uh, there is other parking around that area. 18 units is good. Uh, and we're main there was a few uh, meetings ago we were talking about trees in this a tree in this area which we were going to take down in this instance we're keeping the main maintaining the planting around that area as well um, it mirrors the look of the existing buildings and it's keep we've put in special mention special conditions about the architectural design to make sure they blend it blends in with the with the of the existing estate around the houses around there so you know I, 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 I like it are you moving to a recommendation there Oh, yeah, I would move to a recommendation there, yeah. I'll, 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 Linda, yes, thank you very much. I would second that. Uh, any further comments, Darren? Um, thank you. Um, this is a site that's been knocking around this area for years, decades in many cases. Um, and many of the people who live nearby have come to me, they've come to other people with previous versions of this, not this one. Um, I have two, I, I, Gerald was not doing a deputation as a councillor, he was doing it as a normal human being um, the, this morning, so I'm going to talk about Mr Vernon Jackson's deputation. Um, knowing that Gold Street block in the, in the southwest corner, uh, I'm sorry, but those two houses are too close. Um, to that. I understand the, cons the, the planning concerns about secondary windows, but from the perspective of the council tenants who live there, um, it, they have a it's slightly different. It's very similar to some of the blocks on the Eastern Road in my own ward, particular sort of three, three shaped, nine shaped blocks, and it's very similar to that. Um, if, we could, if we were allowed to change the application, as Mr. Vernon Jackson outlined, and basically get rid of those two houses, um, uh, then I, I, would, I would support this but we aren't, so I can't, and I won't. Um, I'm also concerned around uh, the, the impact on parking. Um, 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 Simon is incredibly hopeful um, and is slightly less cynical than I am uh, about these things, um, but I'm, the, the loss of the three on-street parking spaces, but no idea where else they go in. Um, and also the inability of the local residents well, the ability of the local residents perhaps to have residence parking in areas in that are really narrow is very difficult. So um, a different version of this scheme I would support, this scheme I cannot support, particularly on the impact on that block in Gold, on those council tenants in Gold Street. Are you making a um, proposal? No, there? I'm not making no. a proposal. I'm making a comment. I 
I actually think, Linda, yes, do come on. Yeah, I actually think that those houses, if this matter could be resolved by postponing the decision today, getting the, the developer to go away and think about it, rather than having to submit the whole plan again, which would be totally unfair in my view, I think if people be allowed to see if there can be some amendments made to satisfy the queries raised by people here, I think that would be eminently suitable. So I am proposing that. So you're proposing a deferral? Yes. Okay. Rather than seconding a refusal. John's. Yeah. yeah. I'll step and in I'll and second that. John's proposal that we approve the application just yeah. because we need to be tidy about it. Right. Okay. Um, this is getting a little bit convoluted. Yes, yes, so um, I don't think you need to second Councillor Smith's motion. I think your seconding would already stand, but the way that deferrals work is if you get a seconder for your deferral, it rises to the top of the, the pile for consideration. Um, I think you need advice, though, because it, on the, in terms of what you're seeking through a deferral, it sounds like you might be seeking material changes to the application, which won't be allowed. Unfortunately, the law will require you to do another application on, on that basis. So it would have to be non-material, I think, and I'd, I'd defer to Simon on that in terms of what he would accept. But. Well, um, thank you, Kieran, and thank you, Councillor Simon. Simon, Simon. Um, I don't know what the applicant would prefer, but I suspect a, a deferral than possibly losing a, a vote um, for refusal. Um, what scope there is in the scheme to achieve some more separation um, would have to be discussed if that is the decision. Um, you can see that um, just by moving the property, uh, there's a gap there of, I don't know, about a metre and a half width, whether or not that was closed up. That would produce a bit more relief for that window, but not much. Um, the alternative is taking a, a, a house off the scheme, which has significant implications for the viability of the scheme, perhaps. Um, to answer the question, uh, if it were deferred to look at uh, solutions to, and we need to be clear about what, the, what, what we're looking at, Councillor Sanders has said two issues, the, the light to the window in question, the windows in question, and then the, the loss of parking on Diamond Street, if those are the two issues agreed clearly by the committee. Um, they could both be looked at in the current application, in my opinion, um, with a period of republicity so that any amendments are republicised and that's done quite clearly. Um, that would probably be preferable to the applicant and to the local planning authority. And if it's done clearly for residents so everyone understands what the change is um, and what they're being asked to comment on for a second time, um, then, then that could be a procedural way of doing it, should that be the, the, the decision of the committee to defer it rather than approve or refuse. Do we have a seconder for the idea of deferring it for some minor changes that would resolve those particular problems that have been highlighted by people? Okay. We have a proposal from uh, Councillor Symes. Do we have anybody who would, who would be happy to go that route? I mean, that would address your issues, wouldn't it? Could, maybe. I don't know. Possibly. But I, I think... I think Historically, it's the, I, I think this is, this is a significant change. Um, I think it's a doable change, but I think it's a significant change. And as such, I'm, I'm more with, with Kieran, actually. And I think that... The, We've been advised the way, that it the way could be done as a minor change. So I, I, I will continue, continue as I am. Okay. We've, we've been advised that it could be done. Could, there could, defer, could be a deferral on those grounds. We see those as relatively minor... Um, Changes, which is what you said, uh, Simon, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to bear in mind that one of the alternatives could be a, going to appeal and then no changes having been able to be made. Dave. Sorry, as I'm, I'm not usually on planning, so I'm not kind of au okay fait with what the what the difference is between outright ref refusal and a, what you're saying is deferral, but not just a, it can come back, it's, it's going to come back, but different. I don't know why that's not the same thing. Because it's seen as the, check, correct, correct Sorry. if I'm wrong, uh, Simon, but it's, it's seen as the same planning application, so you don't have to go through the whole um, thing again. Simon has said that any minor minor-ish sort of changes that were made could be the sub would be the subject of public consultation so that the public would know um, that in that sense it would be the same. But also the applicant wouldn't go um, to appeal if it was deferred because unless we took years and years over the deferral, 
because they would, because uh, um, we always have to think about if there's an appeal, then there's no chance to make those sorts of minor improvements. Is that right, Simon? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's just because my, my main concerns on that are the, the fact that people have they've brought up specific things that they that, that they're concerned about. It's not like they just don't want a development there because they don't they don't like it. But one of the things that's come out in, in the paper and in the deputations there is the loss of light and the potential for the loss of privacy, including one which says um uh, again, I'm not really afraid with all things planning but it says not not an invasive loss of privacy as, as though there is a loss of privacy which isn't invasive I guess that's a legal term but yeah those things were bothering me so if we if we propose a deferral with those particular things if we can add into it the, the fact of the loss of light and the loss of pri privacy is that an acceptable thing to you know put on as that's why it's been deferred well I think the loss of light question would have to be uh, sorted out whatever was done by asking the developer to do some light projections, um, which is often done, but, uh, but um, we have had reassurance that it's, it's minimal, if at all, and in a city you are allowed to lose some light, but it would satisfy um, local people who are worried about that. Yeah, because that's... not. I mean, you know, yeah. it probably would. Uh, if, oh, sorry, go on. If, if, they're, if they're changing, knocking down the house, you know, not knocking down houses, but not having houses, is that a minor change or is that a major change? Because I think it seems like quite a major change if you're going from either two to one or two to nothing, and then considering the other side of the road as well, which of the block light. I mean, I kind of, Kieran, could you, would you, because that is such material change, would that really be a referral or? Materiality is a planning judgment, which is why I deferred to Simon in the first case. So, I mean, he needs to be your, your lead point of advice on whether or not the change is material. That's not something I'm equipped as a lawyer to do, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. But I don't think that um, Simon gave us advice that necessarily removing one of the buildings would be would be. I essential. think the difficulty might be that nobody seems to be particularly clear on what changes might be yeah. in their own mind. and my default position is you should really as a committee be looking to determine the application in front of you and not what you might like to see yeah Sorry. It, well it is indeed the committee's decision of course whether it wishes to approve or refuse or defer I, I maintain my advice that absolutely crucially with appropriate publicity so for probity and clarity that publicity would inform neighbours um, of any proposed changes the applicant might wish to make. The applicant may not be able to make or not, may not wish to make the changes that the committee asked for. Um, but my advice remains that um, if it were to be a loss of one dwelling, um, that, you know, that that is, can be clearly advertised to, to residents and their views sought as part of the current application. Um, yeah, that's the key point. Um, it's clear and, and public, so to speak. Um, so that's a committee uh, decision uh, today. Um, uh, we do need to be clear, very pleased, if, through you, Chairman, uh, about um, exactly what, if it's deferred or refused, because there were general concerns about relationships across the site that I've taken you through, and on those general relationships, I've been extremely clear that the, the harm on residential amenity is immaterial, almost, the tiny bit of shadow that might exist in the depth of winter, that sort of thing. Um, Councillor Sanders... Uh, concerns were focused on two specific things. One for Romanesi was the neighbouring property on Gold Street. Mm. Um, that relationship we've looked at, not, I don't think, general amenity. It was that one specific amenity question uh, for the Gold Street secondary windows that the council, uh, Mr Vernon Jackson also raised. And then the second issue was the Diamond Street loss of three parking, as opposed to the more wider issues that I think Councillor Ashmore was referring to. So can we be very clear on that, please, or any, on any decision? Um, thank you. I, I do have concerns around parking. Yes, it meets the space. Yes, it meets the parking standards. The objections are wrong to say that it's not sufficient. It is sufficient. However, if it is sufficient, then I don't see why they should be able to have access to a parking permit scheme that is going down as a result of this development. So. Um, I'm, I, 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 
and, and also, the, sorry to come back, the St. James Hospital precedent comes to my mind, whereby the committee was incredibly clear of the things it wanted PJ Livesey to do. It hasn't always been able to do it because, as uh, the planning officer said, it, part of it was out of our control on things like a natural England survey and stuff like that. And lo and behold, um, they've joined a queue of people um, who, are applying, who are appealing for non-determination to the planning inspector. Um, personally, I think it's easier to take a decision one way or the other today. And then if that decision is to reject this application, I think we're pretty clear, I think, on the steps that need to be taken to, make, to, to perhaps overturn that, that decision. But the St. James, I'm sorry, Simon, the St. James's Hospital precedent is really worrying for me. I don't want to go back there again. I don't want more case conferences um, um, because that, that's wrong for everyone. So that's why I think we need to be, I agree with Kieran, we need to be clear today. We have to uh, deal with each planning application on its merits. So um, we'll not talk about other applications at the same time. We seem to me to have three possibilities. And I wondered sure. if we had a... Uh, Chair, just to kind of make a comment. Um, I think everyone accepts that some development will happen here and needs to happen here, but I think there are too many issues at the moment. We've got, there is probable loss of light to the flats on uh, Silver Street and Stone Street, the loss of light to the flats, the loss of parking, the access on Diamond Street, the issues it's going to have with the nursery. So I think there are just too many issues surrounding this planning application for it to go forward at the moment. So would you, would you then propose a, a refusal? A pro proposed refusal. Okay. So we do have three, and, and does anybody second that? Yeah. Darren? Okay. So we have um, a pro we don't have a, we have one proposal for deferral, uh, and we have a proposal for um, approval, and we have a proposal and a seconder for refusal. Um, have you, do you want to second any of the recommendations that there are here? Uh, are you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I will um, second the proposal to defer this application for minor application for minor changes. Um, which do, what order do we do this in, Kieran? One second. Right, the deferral would go first. Um, I think there's a point of information required for the committee before you go to any voting in relation to uh, the possibility of an extant planning permission for a care home on the site. Um, so I think Simon will take that. Um, and then in that sequence, we, we can then consider the deferral. Um, but... The, other, the problem I've got with the refusal at the moment is you haven't given us any reasons. So if you could articulate some reasons um, before we get to that stage, I think we'll just let Simon place. speak. Okay. And then, yeah. Um, you need to ask, answer the question about the extent planning. Yeah, um, colleagues have been um, planning permission. busy looking at back at the planning history. Um, looking at the history, it would appear that the, uh, the care home consent was correctly, um, it would appear correctly implemented and therefore is extant, which could be completed. What I don't have is uh, information on its uh, position within the site, therefore how, where it sits next to the windows in question, I'm afraid. So it's a bit difficult for me to make any more uh, advice on that. Uh, Kieran, can I ask the um, applicant's representative to s tell us if he knows that, or would that be improper at this stage? Um, sorry, in, in what respect? I mean, I can say that the officers have, set, have shown me in the back channel we have that um, there has been correspondence between the agent asserting um, uh, the, the implementation of permission and the photograph has been provided as well. So I don't think it's necessary to muddy the waters so much by going to the agent in that respect. Okay, and was it a two or three or four storey building? Oh, sorry, is that the question? Um, I think it says in the planning history within the report. Uh, yeah, the 2008 and the 2010 uh, permissions were both four stories. 
There were four stories. Yeah. And do we know exactly where on the site or not? Presumably not. That's what I think Simon Segg is struggling to get you detail on. <laughs> sure. There were four story buildings, so substantially larger. I think it's relevant to, for us to uh, consider that too. Just coming through, I think, um, Chairman. We'll just wait a second while we get the location of those buildings. I don't know how long it will take, Chair. Um, I think Kieran asked about what the reasons for refusal refusal would be loss of light and the uh, material impact for the loss of parking. Thank you for that. Uh, loss of light through you, Chairman, please, to, to which property or properties? 14 to 20 Gold Street. Particularly the ground floor, and no, I don't know which numbers are on the ground floor, Simon, but the ground floor flats at 14 to 20 Gold Street. And I think if this is refused, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the developer is fully aware of why and what we think needs to change in order to, to, to overturn this. Yeah. I'm tempted to throw in the impact on the nursery as well, but I think that might be chancing my arm a bit too much. Uh, but I am concerned about the impact on the nursery. Do those stack up, Simon? Were we to go down that road? Uh, they're valid and clear reasons now. Thank you. Okay. Um, Shall we proceed, or have you got, you've got the information? Good. Yeah. Um, right. Um, the care home, I'll have to describe it to you. Could, could we have the plan up, please, Alison? Thank you. As stated, it, it was a four-storey uh, development uh, that appears to be an extant permission, so could be implemented or continued, constructed tomorrow. Um, it was across the central and southern portion of the site. The northern area of the site was for parking. Um, it had a four-storey elevation facing uh, Gold Street. The key question is how close was it to the windows in question on the gable end of 14 to 20 Gold Street. Uh, the answer is pretty much the same position and maybe a couple of metres further away than the currently proposed property. Um, so uh, that is a three-storey property. Um, what has an, appears to have an extant consent was four-storey, more or less in the same position with a slightly wider gap by a, a couple of metres. So. Swings and roundabouts, the extant permission um, slightly further away, a couple of metres further away from the window, um, but an extra story and, and uh, further deeper into the site, so slightly deeper here. Um, so on the face of it, uh, both would have an impact on that side window. Um, be a judgment on comparing the two impacts, but clearly there was a significant impact uh, from the care home development which is extant and could be developed so to make the comparison um, approving this application in front of you today would not appear to have any greater effect than the development that could be continued be correct to think that because it's four storey a much bigger building it would have worse effect on the loss of light for surrounding properties such as that is well, it's, it's, it's close, so whether or not you're, you're one and a half metres away or so at the present, or, or two and a half, three and a half metres away, um, you get a bit more light uh, with greater gap, of course, but then it's taller, so it's a bit hard to judge. That's why I said it swings and roundabouts, but what I did say is certainly I don't think the proposal would have a worse impact, if anything, probably slightly less impact uh, on light and outlook, um, the proximity of the building, if you look out of the window. So... Um, my opinion would be based on the fact that um, since the proposal is no worse than the extant permission that could be uh, still 
constructed that that makes it difficult to refuse on the point with respect to Gold Street uh, windows. Thank you very much. That um, helps us a little bit, probably. Um, I'm going to then, with your um, approval, go to move to the vote. We'll vote on deferring first. Um, those of people in favor of the deferral to sort out those minor matters, uh, raise their hands. We don't have a um, recommendation for approval because we don't have um, a sec seconder for your proposal, I'm afraid. Yeah, that wasn't quite what I said. Um, oh, or do Symes we? did second and then put forward a deferral, which I think is legitimate because the deferral will be taken first anyway. If it fails, you still need to do the votes against the deferral, by the way. Um, and then, um, yes, we proceed to the to your motion in favour of grants planning permission because you got in there first and then the refusal was the second motion. Okay. If obviously, yeah, it's kind of okay. Okay, and and so of we can. One way or the other. Yep, got it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, all those against the deferral, please raise your hands. And all those abstaining. Thank you. Now we're moving to the vote to approve the application. Um, bearing in mind, we don't have the option of deferring any more. Um, could you um, raise your hands if you'd like to approve the application? Raise your hands if um, you don't want to approve the application. Okay. And any abstentions from that? Okay. Now, do we need to move to a, a proposal to reject the application, or have we done it by... Um... That motion is already seconded, so it yes. comes sequentially second, so it stands. Had that motion succeeded, yours would obviously be to refuse, would have been wiped out, the business would be resolved, yes. but now, Correct. as it's unresolved, we need to take that motion for refusal. Ch Chairman. Sorry. Um, with, with effectively new information or clearer information on the extant permission, um, I think we need to consider again um, the position, uh, the relative positions of the extant permission, which in my opinion would have uh, at least the same or possibly worse effect on the amenity of the Gold Street windows. Um, and that is a material consideration therefore, and I would invite members again to consider uh, whether or not they wish to, uh, or their, their position on the merits of the new scheme, um, therefore, um, and if they were to refuse it uh, when there's an extant permission for an arguably neutral or worse development, um, that is a difficulty, I think, at appeal. Uh, indeed, it could be a cost claim sort of area. So we heard the, or the new advice we've got on the basis of understanding the plans for the extant planning permission. Um, Kieran, you're going to have to advise me on how we deal with this. Do we need to start again with the voting, or do we need to assume that we were taking that into account and progress? You right. I think the, the difficulty you've got here is that the advice you've just received potentially changes the weighting that you would give as a matter of planning judgment to different factors. So... In, on that basis, it's actually legitimate to take the votes again on that basis, on the basis of the advice you just had. It's unfortunate that advice came just after you'd had a vote on whether or not to grant planning permission. Okay. So in terms of the refusal motion, in any case, I'd be inviting you to, to, from obviously what you've heard, whether you'd want to include any of that within a refusal motion. All I was going to say is that um, if we have to decide thing on a it's an individual basis, isn't it, case by case basis? So, extant permission or, or, or otherwise shouldn't really play into what we've already been deciding here, or am I? It does play into it because if there was an appeal, the inspector would certainly look at that first. It plays into it in that respect. So it's not always case by case. No, it is case by case because this case is about this land. Okay. 
then I would be happy to add as a reason to refuse the impact on the Diamond Street nursery, in particular their ability to, uh, in, in particular with regards to the safety of the children during fire drills, which I don't think the 90 bed care home um, affects, but I could be wrong. Mm. Uh, because it has a different access, is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 It appears to move to the motion to refuse the application and take a vote on that. Um, yes. Um, on that basis, I'd just like to clarify that I've got it written down that Holder gave the proposal for refusal Ashmore seconded it. We've then heard quite a bit from Councillor Sanders on things he might like to add in, and I, it needs to be clear from the proposer and seconder that they might like to adopt those. Um, and yeah, I'm happy I... to adopt that. That was one of my concerns as well. <sighs> Simon, any advice on the nursery car parking? <laughs> or um, not parking on children, I suppose? <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, my professional opinion is that uh, it didn't strike any of the officers as a uh, reason for refusal as something that could not be worked out reasonably enough. Um, we're not on a busy, busy main road here. That's, the road's quite narrow, but the level of traffic in the area and so on is, is limited. There is land immediately outside the back of the site, which is where apparently they like to use. Um, as I speculated before about whether or not they can use their own outdoor area. Uh, uh, or whether or not it has to be off the site into the public realm, but there is public realm there um, on pavements and forecourts. Um, the level of traffic in and out of the site uh, it, it would be low and must surely be at slow speeds. That could be controlled by humps or something, but I think it's naturally controlled by the short stretch of road and uh, the, the turns at either end of it. Um, and lastly, we had no uh, objection uh, from the Highways Authority on that point. Um, so that's my advice. I, th I think it's um, a, a bit difficult. Um, that's in respect to the nursery and how they work out their fire drill. Um, in terms of the uh, route you take, um, I would recommend, if, it, if it's not incorrect of me to do so, um, through you, Chair, if I may, um, the deferral might still be a good option. Um, considering the information we've had, apologies, late on about the extant permission and the, the, the effect that has on the considerations. Um, we can bring it back to committee, subject to discussions with the applicant um, relatively swiftly, I would hope, uh, rather than going through um, seeing the, the, the uh, possible refusal and whether or not that goes to appeal or comes back in again and so on. Um, so and we, we could can include, could we, the results of discussions with the school between the applicant and the school about where such fire drills might take place. Yep. Okay, I'm going to, Karen, if, if, guide me if I'm doing wrong here. Can we, um, what order would we do it in, again if we decided to vote again on deferral and vote again on a rejection? Well, currently the only motion on the floor is the refusal as sort of reasserted by Councillor Holder with um, some additional wording around the nursery. Um, I'm assuming that Simon's happy in terms of what he's got to write down if, it, if that is included. Uh, you have currently no proposition for a deferral, so that would be the next procedural stage if you're minded to. Obviously, or the chair, you will control as and when the committee goes to voting. But the, as again, it would be the deferral comes first before substantive motions. So is, is it open to um, any member to propose um, a deferral a second time given the new information we have about the likelihood of an appeal and the difficulty that we might have? Given the new information you've received, yes, I think you can go for another deferral. So I'd like to defer. My, my view is I'm worried that this will go to the planning inspector in the form it is now and there's no, you can't change that then. We have at least got some control over changing it. The planning inspector, I would suggest, will look at this and not see anything terribly wrong with it. And I would second that um, case for deferral. Are the, um, now, you uh, guide us again, would we go for that vote first? Yes, you would. You go for the deferral vote first. 
Okay, we're going to have another vote for deferral. Those in favour of deferral, please raise your hands. Those against deferral, please raise your hands. Okay. Now we still have on the table a proposal for refusal and that we've agreed the grounds that we would, would do uh, reject the application. Could I have those in... Sorry, Chair, could we, could we be very clear on that again um, in the light of the new information about the extent uh, permission um, and this materiality? Could we just double-check if members still wish to propose uh, the two original reasons for refusal, please? I think the third one was um, agreed about the nursery, wasn't it? So it was the... Yes, that's the same reasons. Uh, even though there's extent planning permission, you have said that it is further away and we don't know exactly what the impact on the, the buildings will be. Are you clear on that, Simon? Okay, so we have, uh, according to uh, Councillor Holder there, thank you, um, from Councillor Holder anyway, and the members will vote on that. Still a concern or wishing to propose a reason for refusal for the effect on 14 to 20 Gold Street. Uh, notwithstanding the relative comparison, with, well, can take into account the relative con uh, uh, comparison with the extant permission for the care home. Reason one, we could draft that into a reason for refusal. Um, reason two would be the loss of parking, um, <coughs> which I think is a, is a, is a weaker reason, uh, but you've heard my opinion on that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, are we voting on a third reason for the fire it's arrangements? The, um Difficulties regarding the um, nursery and their fire drills. Yes, yeah. I'd like that included as well. And sorry to go back to the first reason. I, I, I think um, not only is it loss of light, but I, I can't remember if any, there was any mention about loss of outlook. Yes. Having the wall in front of you. Right. Councillor Sanders has, has indicated yes. Thank you. But it's holder that counts along with his seconder. Okay, so we have uh, three uh, reasons for refusal. That the, uh, I'm not sure um, what policy we would attach the uh, the fire drills to. Um, I suppose it would be, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but highway safety. Oh, thank you, it's your turn. Um, it's the amenity and safety of the nursery. You, it's because you said, Simon, uh, that essentially the nursery's objection is correct. Your view is that there is another place they can go to, um, but that, that to me affects the amenity and the safety of the children at the nursery. So, Thank you. Three reasons. Is everybody clear then on the reasons that uh, we might refuse this application? So all those in favour of refusing this application on those three grounds, raise your hands, please. Okay. All those against that decision, raise your hands. So we have refused this application. I'm going to move on before we have any sort of comfort break to go straight to uh, 262 Chichester Road, listed number two on, the, on number six on your application, um, and ask. Simon to um, introduce this application for us now. Welcome back, Councillor. Are we doing again? No, we're not. We're doing 262 Chichester Road. It's an application for a um, change of use from dwelling house class 3 to dwelling house class C3 or house in multiple occupation class C4. Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there are no updates. I just remind myself as much as anyone, um, but we have the applicant here uh, to speak in favour of the scheme. So the application at 262 Chichester Road is for uh, a change of use from a Class C3 dwelling house to a flexible permission between either Class C3 
or a small HMO C4 with the ability to move between the two without needing planning permission for the next 10 years. That's the, applica that's the application site for you in red. Um, and the report mentions it has an access from the side road um, up there where you can't see my cursor uh, along along the back there there's a side alleyway which does provide access unusually into the rear of the property for bicycle storage for example it's the front of the property there's the HMO count just to remind myself um, the figure is 3.77 for numbers of HMOs in the area, including the application site, so below your standard uh, of the policy threshold of 10%, so deemed to be broadly acceptable with respect to community balance and wider amenity. Uh, existing floor plans of the property, the real ground floor extension there, two-storey, and then going across uh, three stories with some redevelopment at the rear and in the roof uh, proposed uh, with the usual array of bedrooms and en suites including in the roof space there um, and some photographs of some of the rooms upstairs bathroom bedroom two bedroom one bedroom three and then uh, clockwise, the front room downstairs, the kitchen, another view of the kitchen, and the last view of the kitchen. A view of the WC and the rear garden and the rear of the property for completeness. Um, the, uh, all the rooms comply uh, with your floor uh, standards and, and layout disposition and so on. So on those two principal tests, and all the other material considerations, uh, the application is considered uh, to be acceptable um, and has come to committee because of the calling request from Councillor Swan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any deputations um, for this one? Um, anybody against this who's doing a deputation? No. Okay, I'll ask you to uh, come in then, Simon Hill. <coughs> Speaking thank you very much and uh, thank you also for moving this forward really appreciate that so I can confirm at this stage the HMO license has not been applied for for this property which is very normal we've only started the enabling works we're currently waiting for planning to hopefully be approved today and then we'll commence the full works at which point we'll apply for the license I'd note we've never had an application um, for a license refused and once finished we ensure that all the properties are fully compliant with the licensing conditions set out by the relevant documentation we are currently still waiting for building regulations Regulations approval. The plans have been submitted, but we're still awaiting their approval. We've checked with the officer this morning, and we expect to have approval in the next seven days. Again, we've never had any of our drawings refused with any minor recommendations ever provided. I, rec I recognise that I've presented much the same deputation at the last ten committee meetings, so I apologise for any uh, parts of my deputation that you've heard previously. I am very pleased to confirm that one of the councillors has come forward last t week and accepted my invitation to visit one of our HMOs. I'm really excited about that happening next week. If anybody else would like to attend, you'd be more than welcome. Firstly, and probably most importantly, within a 50 metre radius, which is the stress test, there are 53 properties. Only two of these have been identified as an HMO. So, including 262 Chichester Road, there will only be 3.77% HMOs. Falls well below the 10%, um, indeed is less than 40% of the maximum allowed. The works we've carried out are all carried out under permitted development. That is to say that all of the works that we carry out do not require planning permission themselves. Indeed, only the occupation of the property by more than two unrelated individuals requires planning. It's also important in this specific case to note that the property has an interesting sales history. Very sadly, the previous owners had quite a number of sales fall through, and hence they were very close to missing out on their dream family home, which was their onward purchase, particularly as they'd already extended 
extended their mortgage offer a number of times and the mortgage company had confirmed they would not extend again. We therefore came in uh, by invitation from the agent and we had less than 30 days to purchase the property. We still honoured the original price that they'd been offered. I say this to demonstrate that I believe we acted in a morally correct manner and to demonstrate that there were plenty of opportunities for other parties to purchase this property for other uses. We currently employ over 50 local subcontractors for our conversion of these properties and as such the conversion of this property provides direct benefits to others within the city. To quickly address some of the objections, in terms of the principle of a development, the property is currently a C3 dwelling house. We're seeking approvals for it to be a C4 six bedroom HMO. The principle has been set out by the SPD and the most important factors as identified by the planning officer have been met, which is namely room sizes and community balance. In terms of standard of accommodation, um, we now have a waiting list of tenants built up for some of our rooms. The properties will be of a high standard, both in regards to standard of construction, standard of finish, particularly the standard of furnishings and aesthetics. All rooms and en-suites are compliant with size and space standards. Indeed, the communal area, which has to be 22 and a half metres squared, is actually 42 and a half metres squared, so it's 188 per cent of the size it needs to be. And also the bedrooms will range from 100 to 121 per cent of the size they need to be. Um, just quickly, we do have a cleaner visit these properties every single week when they're finished. Um, we have a process to follow should there ever be an excess of waste, which will usually be collected within the same day or within 24 hours. We hold a waste carrier's license and we use this to dispose of any resultant waste. Similarly, the main soil stack within the property and an indeed the underground drainage for this property will be upgraded during the build phase. And although this isn't a requirement of building control or planning, we think this is extremely beneficial and really important. Um, the SPD determines that parking is not a material issue. Uh, we have and are currently undertaking a number of developments on Chichester Road and we haven't found any problem with parking ourselves, despite the fact there are, is a bus stop pretty much opposite this property. Uh, indeed, we would encourage the tenants to use this bus stop and we will provide um, bike storage for at least four bikes. It's often a criticism of HMOs that they take away the community aspect of the area. I believe this is unfounded and actually a lack of HMOs, in my opinion, takes away from having a diverse community. I think it's easy to look negatively at HMOs. We often only hear of the worst case scenario. Um, we provide accommodation for young professionals who are paramount to the future of this city. Uh, indeed, only a few weeks ago, one of the properties we had in Wallington Road, um, we had one of the neighbours uh, to the right-hand side of the property who was in tears when she told us that she'd lived in the road for over 40 years and the last three weeks that we'd been working on site were the most communication she'd had from anybody living in the road in over 20 years. Um, recently, um, Spare Room uh, did a study which showed that people looking for rooms um, was on the increase and there was an increase of 37% uh, in one month alone last year. Uh, indeed, the searches for the terms builders included increased 260% from March to August this year. I say this to demonstrate the fact that ultimately HMOs are becoming more and more important in society. And actually, <clears throat> I'd urge members of this committee and the council to work with developers like us that do the highest standard and most compliant HMOs um, to work with us rather than potentially against us to make sure that we bring these brilliant HMOs to the market rather than those who are looking to implement HMOs that have substandard accommodation uh, and rooms that are too small. So in summary there is uh, an undersupply of HMOs in comparison to the um, SPD and the requirements. All of the rooms are oversized and our, our properties are of a really high standard. Thank you very much and uh, I hope you look on this application favourably. Thank you very much Mr Hill. Um, can I move now to um, questions f from members if there are any? Darren? On the grounds that nobody else was. Um, just a couple, Simon. Um, how many people live at the play, in the place now? Do we know? I don't know, uh, uh, Councillor. Right. Um, it could be one, it could be ten. You know, it's, well, a, it's a family-sized uh, C3 dwelling, so... You know, I'm just noticing it because of the, you know, the, the highways engineer says there's an increase for half a parking space. Yeah. And what I don't know is how many people are there now. So we can make an idea of how many cars there are. Um, the, the second bit is around what you say in 
the report around some roads, you know, some houses in the road are subdivided into flats, which is something I, I know exists from walking down there. Um, do we know how many, um, presumably we don't know how many, is this a frequent occurrence? One of the objectors says that there's lots of HMOs there. And if you're saying they're being subdivided into flats, then it's an understandable link to, to basically link the two, even though in planning terms, you don't. If you don't know, that's fine. Yeah, um, well, we'd have to check through a combination of uh, planning history, because some, but maybe not all, may have planning permission for subdivision into flats. Um, address points uh, from, you know, uh, the post office, etc. Those would be the two principal ways. I think we'd probably, apart from pounding the street as well, trying to guess. But those would be the two ways of trying to estimate. But I, I'm not sure we have a, a clear figure for the whole street council. That, 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 that's fine. Thank you for that, Simon. Those are my two questions, Judith. Thank you. Any further questions from members? Ian. Uh, one of the objections was concerns over the accuracy of the HMO database for the area. Are we happy that that's now accurate? Yes, Councillor, in a nutshell, yes. Um, for every application for, for wider benefit, um, we, we have the council tax records, the planning history and the licence records. Um, we have the site visit and then we write to the local councillors as well uh, and, and or any neighbours who tell us what about X or Y property. Some of them turn out to be flats as opposed to HMOs and occasionally we will find another one. And you know, we, So we always double check. So yes, the short answer is yes. Dave. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to uh, note that of the the, the um, objections on there, one of them was the uh, concerns over the accuracy of the HMO database for area. And indeed, it says that officers went back and found that they'd missed one. So they, they were they were right, but it was one extra which falls well within the range of it. The other one, and it might be me being a bit thick, it's been known, is it's the last one says inaccuracies around highways information within design and access statement. I, I'm not sure what that means or if that or if whatever it means has been addressed. Yeah, I, um, I did look at that, Councillor. Um, we thought it was too complicated and, and possibly just a, a misunderstanding to try and address it in the report, but you've raised it so well spotted. Um, I, there may or may not be an inaccuracy in the, in the design and access statement, but it's the assessment by the local planning authority, by offices, and today by the, uh, the committee that, that's important. I think there was a misunderstanding of uh, what parking bays would be expected from a house, but in this instance, like in much of Portsmouth, there aren't actually any provided off street. I think there was a misunderstanding, no criticism of the neighbour on that. Um, so there was no there was no difficulty in the, uh, the statement from our point of view, and, and no reason to to have a concern about the, the, the highway matters. Any further questions? In which case, I'll move to um, comments and recommendations. Um, Darren. Uh, I wish to move the officer's recommendation to, to, for this property. Uh, firstly, it, it meets all our space standards. Um, Simon said, well, what can this committee do to help improve those people who stick to our space standards? My, my gentle suggestion from my email inbox is to get landlords to actually back them. I think it would be mildly useful. Um, uh, we recognize they may change from time to time, but there are some very unhappy people out there. Uh, and I think working with people who want to um, provide decent quality uh, properties um, is, is sensible. Uh, I think the other thing that, frankly, it's not going to be us that's going to be your problem. It's the valuation office, as you well know, um, which means an extra 100 quid a month uh, on, people's, on people's rents in these properties. It meets our space standards, um, as far as I can see. Um, I understand the concerns. Uh, I think there's a particular issue in, in this part of Copna around HMS versus flats, whereby many residents understandably feel that what in planning terms is flats is actually HMOs. Perfectly understandable, perfectly realistic, and I think some more work may be required for our planning colleagues to look at that uh, in key areas. But as far as I can see, this meets our space standards, and there's no way we would uh, win this appeal, uh, a refusal to win an appeal. Can I have I? no heavy heart, by the way, uh, on these things, um, because it meets our space standards. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you very much, Gerald.
In the absence of any alternative um, proposals, then I will ask you all to vote for um, granting planning permission as described on page um, 82 with those conditions. Would you um, raise your hands if you'd like to grant planning permission for this one? So we have, um, did you count those, Kieran? I made that six in favour. Okay. Anybody against? Raise your hand. One. And anybody abstaining? Raise your hand. One. Thank you very much. You have your planning permission. Thank you very much. Um, before we have a break, we'll move on to 260 Laburnum Grove, which is the next one in your documents pack. And um, Simon, could you please um, introduce this one? It's on page 80, 83, members. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. 260 Laburnum Grove. This is an application uh, to change the use from a C3 dwelling house to a sui generis large house in multiple occupation for seven persons. Um, I'll come back to the SMATs and deputations at the end. Here is the property in red, uh, a mid-terraced property, Port Sea Island. That's the front of the property, a bit of a front garden, two-storey. The HMO data count. A uh, 3.07 percentage um, resultant number of a uh, percentage of HMOs in the 50 meter radius, including the one you can see existing and the proposed site. So again, well below the 10 percent judgment, broadly speaking, around community balance and overall local amenity. Existing floor plans as a rear conservatory that members may see there, on the top left. That's to be remodelled and extended with a development there. So we had a, a new plan just to confirm the uh, double skin and remodelling of the what was a, what is a conservatory uh, to make that to building regulations, of course, next to the bedroom there. Um, that's in the SMAT, just to be clear. So just a reference to updating the approved plan numbers if the application is approved. Um, uh, satisfied with the internal accommodation in terms of the immunity for the potential future occupiers, uh, good sized bedrooms and meeting all the standards with respect to those bedrooms and therefore the communal areas offered and the sanitary uh, provision. For completeness, uh, some photographs across the building, clockwise again from the top left, the lounge, upstairs rear bedroom, kitchen, Upstairs front bedroom, the rear light well down the side of the rear wing, there's the rear of the property, that the conservatory that would be remodeled, straight rebuilt and extended under permitted development. So uh, in the round, uh, your officers are happy that there will be no community imbalance resulting and uh, the accommodation provided would also be a good accommodation. That's the presentation, and there may be a deputation from the applicant. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we have um, certainly the agent is here to speak for the application. Do we have anybody here to speak against it? No, okay, then. Carry on, would you like to uh, carry on? Carry on, Wells. Thank you. My name is Carrie Ann Wells and I'm the agent working for Appacore, representing the client at 260 Laburnum Grove. This property complies with all of the relevant planning policies and complies with the Housing and Multiple Occupation Supplementary Planning Document 2019. I've heard concerns about parking in the room. Um, I just want to say that Appacore, we now manage properties and out of the three generous properties we manage, the average car ownership per property is approximately two cars. This is not dissimilar to the predicted car ownership for a C3 family home. In some cases, with the more and more sort of teenagers staying home, you're, you're probably looking at more. So 
in my opinion, or certainly from the properties we manage, we're looking at actually less car ownership than an average C3 family home. The 10% HMO density has been put in place by Portsmouth City Council to ensure mixed and balanced communities. There is only one other HMO property within the 50 metre density, resulting in a HMO density of just 3.07%. Creating this HMO property will contribute to providing a mixed and balanced community. The application is to enable the property to be used as a shared living property for seven individuals for which co-living may be the ideal solution for an all bills included independent living option, whilst also providing so so sorry, social interaction for the residents. There is a clear need for shared housing for young professionals in the area who cannot afford to get on the property ladder. This is demonstrated by the ease in which these type of properties are being let. The property will be designed and finished to a high standard and the property will also be managed professionally. It's always in the property owner's best interest to ensure that complaints are dealt with promptly and efficiently. The property will provide 28.87 square metres of communal space at ground floor level for eating and dining. This is above the 22.5 square metres communal space required when all bedrooms are in excess of 10 square metres. All the bedrooms within this property are in excess of 10 square metres and additionally benefit from an ensuite bathroom. At Applecore, we only work with clients who share our passion to create high quality shared housing for individuals and this property meets that goal. So to conclude, this property is fully compliant with policy and therefore I respectfully request this application is approved today. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from members on this application? Darren. Thank you, Judith. Um, paragraph 3.3, .3, um, I have to say, confused me totally. Simon. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain what I think it says, because I think that may lead to one of the, that may lead to some of the concerns, particularly if you've got a 200 signature petition knocking around. My understanding, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that the construction work outlined in your photos um, can be done anyway, under permitted development. That is correct. Yeah? As a C3 property or C4. That's, thank you, that, that's where I'm coming from. So, but what you're saying is effectively that work can be done and then an applicant can then, having done all that extra work that's required, effectively to turn it into a HMO if they want to turn it into a HMO, but all that work can be done under permitted development. That is correct, is it not? Even if the intention is eventually to turn it into, into a HMO. <coughs> Yes, the intentions are not what's important. It's, it's following the legislation, um, uh, but it must, importantly, be occupied as a C3 or C4 with the permitted extensions. Then it could be for a short period of time, and then it could be converted into the large HMO. If right, it has so, plan, so if basically it has they can't just, so no developer can just sort of do it all up, leave it for six months. Um, and then say, excuse me, can it be a HMO, please? Someone's to actually got to live in there. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, it's just, I think, Judith, I think it's a real concern. I know there are areas of people in, in my, my ward who are worried about that sort of thing happening and properties being left for a while and then suddenly they see a HMO application and suddenly they go, oh, really? And, and I think that's if we're trying to sort of create consent here and trying to sort of rectify that balance, and I think that sort of stuff, knowing that sort of stuff through planning rules is very helpful. I know that's a comment, Judith, but it's just 3.3 .3 was a bit confusing for me. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I've, I've got one, if not. Are we sure that the uh, bedrooms on the top floor of this uh, property, as shown on page 85, are um, the ceiling height is high enough to give us the uh, figures that are on the table um, of room sizes on page um, 88 or 9, 89. Yes, Councillor, I I'm confident the case officer would have checked that. Thank you. Any further questions? Any comments then? Gerald? Thanks. Um, there isn't a reason in planning policy that we've got to turn this down, um, so I'm sorry. Well, I'm I don't like HMOs particularly, but there is no planning reason that is sustainable to refuse this that I can see. Therefore, I think we have no option but to, to approve it. Though, therefore, I'm therefore happy to uh, move the officer recommendation. And then are you happy to 
you lend us happy to second that. In the absence of any alternative um, um, recommendations, then we'll move to um, approve this application subject to the conditions described here. Can you all raise your hands if you um, want to approve this application? Does anybody want to um, reject the application? Thank you. Does anybody want to abstain? Thank you. So you have your permission. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, can I ask, the last two applications both came here at the request of a councillor mm. who hasn't attended. Mm. Uh, uh, it just seems to be good manners, at the very least, if you do ask for something to come here to a committee that you attend. Do you think we could remind councillors that if they are requesting something to, be, to come to committee, they really should come and, and speak? Um, we, we have to put the time in, so I think they should as well. Yeah, it's the same councillor for both. Uh, councillor, I will do that, um, and um, we'll, we'll make a practice of, of, of doing that and insisting that people are here. Thank you. I'm, I'm, that's two letters to Councillor Swan. I may save paper and just write one. Thank you very much. Can I go on with one, one further application, or do we need a break now? I uh, would just point out that Councillor Symes has absented herself, presumably on the assumption that we're breaking now. Okay. Um, could I ask you all to be back here at... Uh, it's, it's, it, could, I, could you be back here at quarter two, if that clock is right, which gives you about 12 or 13 minutes? Okay, be, be back here and we'll get started and uh, uh, should be able to get through the other applications um, straight afterwards. Back at quarter two.
And we're going to, I'm so sorry, I'll start again. We're going to do 17 Craneswater Park first, then we're going to do Lakeside Business Park because both of those have deputations, and then we'll move on to the other two applications where there's nobody waiting to give a deputation. Simon, would you like to introduce 17 Craneswater Park to us, please? It's on page 57, and there's a SMAT item at, um, on, at number four. Thank you, Chair. 17 Cranes Water Park has a uh, proposal for a two-story front extension and a part single, part two-story rear extension and roof alterations, including raising the ridge height. Location, the application site is in the middle of Craneswater Park area, that's um, gyratory you can see there if I can call it that, in the middle, uh, in the conservation area, X marks the spot for the property. To its west it has some sizeable properties divided into flats, uh, to the east a detached dwelling house. There you are on the right hand side, number 19, uh, the subdivision into flats and on the left hand side <coughs> the C3 dwelling house, family dwelling house at number 15. Um, you can see number 17 in the middle as it is today. Uh, I forget how old it is but not, not a very old property um, designed to be more or less uh, pastiche if I can use that word for the area in terms of its material and, uh, materials and design overall approach. Um, just quickly, there are the properties to the left-hand side uh, that are not so important for this application um, because the development is concentrated on the other side. I'll skip over these as well. Uh, this is at the rear where the uh, part single story, part two story development would sit on that patio there and extending towards the right-hand side uh, of the image. You can see a reasonable gap to the property number 15 behind, hence the lack of uh, objection from them indeed and no concerns from the planning authority with respect to their amenity. The tree in front of you there is the one we've picked up in the SMAT if I may jump between the two. Um, looking back at the history uh, next door we believe that to be a sycamore. Um, that's lying close to the boundary and so without due care and attention its roots would be damaged almost certainly to some degree uh, with the proposed uh, extension right next to it on the other side of the fence hence the extra condition we've proposed in appendix 2 which would deal with uh, pile and raft foundations as essentially so you very carefully uh, look um, with I'm not sure that they're not actual x-rays but some some sort of visioning like archaeologists use to find the roots without disturbing the soil and then you can also hand dig as well to find out where the roots are and where there's a gap that's where you put the pile and a raft on top of that so that you can build quite close to a tree without uh, unduly affecting its roots aeration moisture etc so that's that extra condition to deal with that. Right, um, jumping on, there are the uh, existing elevations on the left-hand side, proposed on the right. So the principal elements to draw to your attention are the two-story front element. So going from the existing uh, forward bay uh, being enlarged in width, widened, and the ridge going up. the ridge going up by a metre and a half compared to the existing. It's hard to compare them in terms of scale on this, but um, there's a slight up uptick in the um, increase in the ridge height there. Um, otherwise, some modernisation of the front door and the dormer, the retained dormer going from a pitch roofed to a flat roofed. So they're taking a slightly more contemporary feel, albeit the materials would still be uh, more traditional in terms of red brick render and a red roof clay, which we've conditioned then to the rear, it's hard to tell again, but um, that's the side view uh, of the photograph we saw earlier on. So this is from the neighbour where the tree is looking at the side of the property. It will be extended at two storey with this rear element 
There aren't any lines to show you, but that rear segment there and the single story there. So that's what the neighbours to the east would look at. Um, but as I've said earlier, there were no objections to the re reasonable uh, extension with respect to the neighbours or the officers. So that, that's the, the long and short of the uh, proposal. Um, so it's had three objections, hence it coming to planning committee, but um, we're satisfied that uh, it has no undue effect on the neighbours or the conservation area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, could I ask um, Mr. Pickup to um, do his deputation? Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. As you will know from your officer's very thorough report, the application seeks essentially to consolidate and combine two earlier grants of planning permission within a single development. The planning permission granted under 20552 HOU allowed the construction of a part single part two story rear extension, whilst planning permission 2553 HOU allowed the construction of a two story front extension. Both schemes were granted planning permission in, on the 19th of February 2021. In effect, the application before you this afternoon seeks to combine both of the two-storey and single-storey extensions granted permission last year within a single development with the same footprint, as well as propose some other minor changes. If members look at page 58 of the committee report, you will see the Craneswater Park street scene as it currently exists. If members then go to figure 3 on page 59, you will see at the bottom image the street scene as permitted last year. The top image at figure three shows the street scene proposed by the planning application currently before you. Members will see that the main changes relate to the construction of a hip to ridged roof above the two-storey part of the building adjacent to number 15 Craneswater Park, which is to the east. The gap between 17 and 15 will be maintained at six, six metres. In, if the roof of the dwelling was constructed by combining the two applications permitted in 2021, the front extension will be built with a flat uppermost section, together with a double-hipped roof with central valley gutter at the rear. The current proposal seeks to build a single-hipped ridged roof over the front and rear two-storey extensions, so simplifying the roof's construction, reducing the need for long-term maintenance and improving the dwelling's appearance within the street scene and conservation area. The modified roof would result in an increase in height of approximately 1.1 metre. Given this modest increase in height, given that this modest increase in height will be on the east side of the dwelling, it is considered that there will be no detrimental impacts on current levels of residential amenity. On the west side of the dwelling, other than changing the roofing materials and the re-roofing of the existing dormer from a hipped roof to a flat roof, there will be few changes. The material planning considerations that should be assessed in relation to the application proposal relate to whether the proposed development is on an appropriate design, does it preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area, does it have any adverse impacts on residential amenity. With regard to the first two of these considerations, I agree with the conclusions of the case officer. The proposal, whilst resulting in a comprehensive remodelling of the existing building on its eastern side, will still maintain something of the traditional form of typical properties in this area. The case officer goes on to comment the western section of the building would remain as is. She continues, it is considered that the increased height of the eastern side of the building is, is acceptable in both its relationship with the neighbouring property to the east and also the wider street scene. She also confirms that the proposed pallet of materials would not be harmful in the context of the area. With regards to impact on the conservation area, the case officer states the form of the pitch roof alterations and proposed external materials are considered to result in an extended building that would sit relatively comfortably within the context of the area and would preserve the character and appearance of the conservation area and not harm its significance. Finally, with regards to impact on residential amenity, the case officer notes that the current scheme would retain the western side of the building as is, apart from the replacement of the pitch roof and the forward dormer with a flat roof. She goes on to state the footprint, two-storey nature and window placement of the proposed front and rear extensions have already been considered acceptable in their relationship with surrounding de development under permissions 2552 HOU and 2553 HOU, and this still remains the case. The additional height and massing as a result of the proposed roof design is not considered to result in a loss of light or outlook. In conclusion, the applicant seeks only to modify very slightly what has already been permitted by the City Council in a manner that would both ensure easier long-term maintenance of his home and achieve a better looking building. As such, the applicant respectfully requests that the members of the Planning Committee 
follow your, follows your officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, questions to um, Simon, please. Darren? Um, if others want to go first, they can. No, we just want to get on with it, Darren. All right, thank you, Gerald. Um, so, the first thing is you talk about some, you talk about substantial removal, but not demolition. What sort of substantial removal are we looking at in, in, with this, this application? Early on in your... Um, well, it, it, there's a remodeling um, of the front, so um, if we could have the plans up, please, Alison, again. So at the moment, we have that forward uh, gable that would be, well, demolished, that element of the house, at the front of the house, and, and rebuilt oh. wider. And so slightly. the front of the house would be would be demolished and replaced with what your, that, that your is on, yes? Yeah? That, that element, okay. yeah, yeah. So the elements of demolition and rebuilding at the front, yes, and at the back, it's extension, pure extension, really. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, the, the, the applicant talked about the, the uh, consents that have been given and the permissions that have been given. Um, but in paragraph 114, we have a very long refusal list. Um, and I note that this application, the LDD, was January 2022. Um, and the final of the refusals was September 2022. Um, what has been the, the status of those two applications? Is this something that has been put together in the last few weeks it doesn't sound like it I, I'm concerned that even if we grant this the applicant may come back again with other ideas uh, well yes I mean that's the applications um, prerogative um, so the applicants prerogative I should say uh, yes so the most recent uh, refusal um, just above 115 paragraph um, yeah just refused a month ago so the applicants got um, some time left to appeal that should they wish um, it's up to them. Okay. And that's separate to this application, okay. somewhat different proposal there. That was a three-storey dwelling, etc. So rather different. Here's a slightly different approach, a less, yeah. less so, extensive approach. I just want to see. Uh, just want to see because the appeals have been dismissed twice. Um, so I just want to check what is different to what on the surface looks the same thing in terms of the titles. Is your argument that actually the, the ones that got refused? Um, deal with 19 Cranes Water Park, and effectively that's what they call the first floor, but it actually looks like the ground floor, um, flat on, on that side that, uh, that, that stretches out. Um, that by focusing on number 15, on the, the side facing number 15, that number 19 first floor flat would simply not be affected mm -hmm. in the way we felt, for instance, that Gold Street would be affected earlier on because it's a bit further mm -hmm. away. Is that reasonable? That's exactly correct with respect to the, the neighbours and the other reasons for refusal on some of the applications was effect on the conservation area in terms of design and scale. Again, with this application, we don't have that concern. Okay, so you feel that the, the, reason, that the reasons for refusal have been overcome? Well, it's a different scheme. There's a lot of different schemes, so there's elements that might be from, you know, overlap one with the other. Um, but the, the two principal problems we've had with either and both, uh, both for one application or one or the other, uh, have been the immunity to the west, as you pointed out, and or to the conservation area, uh, to the front principally. And we don't have either of those two concerns with this one because it's, it's got development on the eastern side. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much. Any further questions? In which case, I'll move on to comments. Gerald? Can I move the officer's recommendation? Would anybody second that? Linda, thank you very much. Um, unless I have alternative um, suggestions, can I ask you all to raise your hands if you want to approve this application? You have your planning application. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to move on to the lakeside development. Nice, and uh, I will have to go due to the aforementioned advice, legal, legal advice. And, and that means I'll, yeah, I shan't return for the rest of the meeting because I've got to be gone at half past, isn't it? So. I'll bid the committee will we farewell. Still be quorum? Will we still be quorum? Yes, we will. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, but we need to be aware that I'm excluded from the one about the um, about the port. So as long as you still have four, we do. Um, 
then you'll be okay. We do. We'll do the port one last. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Simon, would you like to um, move to, to explain the uh, Lakeside application to us? And we do have a uh, smat on this. Um, also, um, on page two, and also a new condition on page um, it's page six. Thank you very we much. Simon. Thank, thank you, Councillor. This is an application at Lakeside Business Park in the north of the city. Um, for the, principally for the installation of solar power canopies over existing car parking bays and roof mounted solar panels uh, and the reconfiguration of some of the parking areas uh, connected both to the wish for some more parking and to accommodate the solar power canopies uh, with uh, some additional parking bays. So just to locate everyone, that is the Lakeside uh, Developments Business Park in the centre of your picture there, north of the M27 and the 275 and south of the A27 with the principal access off the eastern side there. So you can see uh, in the northern third or half you've got uh, external parking, the buildings in the middle section of the site and then the lake in the southern side bit more of a, a view there to get a feel for the uh, scale of the business park. Um, some existing what appear to be solar panels already on parts of the building and then other parts of the buildings would have the extra solar panels on the roof, on the roofs. Then in the car park, across the car park, as another diagram in a moment, um, would be some extra parking and the canopies placed over the car parking bays on which to present the solar panels. And then um, mentioned in the SMAT was uh, the location of a battery store compound. There's a couple of what appear to be utility type buildings already here. It would be located next to those uh, for storage of large batteries uh, associated obviously with the uh, solar panels in the car park. That gives you a better idea of the uh, distribution of the proposals across the site. <clears throat> so in the southern half, the different roofs where solar panels will be placed, and then across the main body of the car park, that's, those are the, uh, the canopies over parking bays. A bit more detail. There's the compound area for the, um, next to the uh, batteries, and then the range of long canopies and another area here for the proposed solar panels. So the sort of thing you might have seen in hotter Mediterranean countries, for example, um, I think in the past they were just for shading of cars, but here it's more for going straight to the solar panels for sustainable energy generation, of course. So you can get a, a, a feel there for the scale of the structures, either single-sided on the left-hand side, top left, depending on the uh, arrangement of the car parking or, or double-sided, so to speak, where cars are facing each other on either side. So you get different sorts of arrangement there across the top diagram, depending on whether it's a double or single uh, installation, effectively. Um, there's some more I indications around the solar panels on the roofs, and there's a bit more of a, a close-up of the sorts, uh, the appearance of the, of the metal structure uh, with the solar panels above it and again there. Thank you. Um, so uh, back to the SMAT, we mentioned the solar, uh, the battery store compound. Otherwise, um, I'll read it from the SMAT. To complete the suite of environmental planning conditions already set out in the published report, we propose an extra condition to address site drainage as well. So that's set out in full in Appendix 3. And I believe we have uh, deputations from the applicant. We have uh, two um, people wanting to give a deputation in favour of one person wanting to give a deputation in favour of the application. Can I ask you to use up to 12 minutes now? 
Good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the committee for the opportunity to make this statement today in support of the planning application for Lakeside Business Park. My name is Laura Black and I'm a principal planner at Tetra Tech Planning, the planning consultants advising Portsmouth City Council's estates team and Custom Solar on this application. This application is for full planning permission for the installation of roof and ground mounted solar panels at Lakeside Business Park. The reason for this application being heard by committee today is due to the fact the site is owned by Portsmouth City Council and due to the proposed size of the development. Portsmouth City Council are investing in a number of solar projects across the city, Lakeside being one of the largest. The project will not only improve the sustainability credentials of the authority, but also contribute to the authority's objectives for the wider management of the impacts of climate change. Solar panels are now widely accepted as an important part of delivering greener and more efficient energy and can be well integrated into most sites with minimal impact. The application seeks planning permission for the installation of solar-powered canopy, canopy structures over the existing car park bays in the north and south car parks and for roof-mounted solar panels on the rooftops of five of the existing buildings. The proposal would also involve some minor reconfiguration of the main north car park to provide a number of additional parking bays. The additional car parking spaces will be created as a result of the requirement to remove some of the small areas of poor vegetation situated within the north car park in order to install the solar carport canopies at a continuous length. This is required in order to maintain the canopy array sizes and reduce the need for further cable trenching works. Enhancements will be made to the other areas of greenery across the site to mitigate any impact from the loss of these small pockets of greenery. Before COVID-19, Lakeside had some issues with car parking on site and the number of occupiers and visitors increasing regularly. Lakeside fully expect the numbers to return to pre-COVID in the near future, therefore the additional park parking spaces will be greatly needed. As the development would not result in any loss of parking spaces, there would be no subsequent increase in on-street parking levels in the immediate area. The proposed development involves the installation of 1,858 PV panels across the rooftops of the Lakeside North Harbour buildings and an additional installation of 11,170 panels which are to be secured to the new solar carports. Electricity will be stored in batteries held on site within secure storage units. Excess energy generated will go towards EV charging via battery so some energy will be used immediately, some stored on site and some will be sold to the grid. The roof installations will not be readily visible from the ground level and will be fitted with panels sitting 300 millimetres above the ground, above the roof at their highest point. They will also be fitted with low reflective glass to ensure that maximum carbon savings and renewable energy generation are made. The solar carports will be made up from two types of systems, the Delta Mono carport system and the Delta Gullwing carport system. Both would be fixed via concrete plinths and would have a maximum height of 4.5 metres, a width of 7.5 metres and a depth of 3.5 metres. We believe that the design of the proposed development will work well with the immediate and wider surroundings. Due to the separation of the site and nearby, nearby residential properties, there will be no impact on the immunity of neighbouring residents with, with regards to loss of outlook or loss of light. A glint and glare assessment was carried out to assess the impact on the local transport network, including the nearby M27. This report concluded that the proposed development poses only a low risk to drivers due to obstruction from leafage and the density of the trees. A flood risk assessment of the area was also undertaken and concluded that the site is in flood zone 1 and therefore a low risk of flooding. The proposed solar carports will sit at a significant height above existing ground levels, so any change in risk to the site as a result of the proposed development is considered to be low. It is also concluded that the site was at low risk from all other potential flooding sources. There have been no objections received from the authority's statutory consultees to the application, with the county ecologist requesting that an ecological management plan and construction environment management plan be secured by condition if the application is approved. As confirmed by the lack of objections and the case officer's recommendation for approval, the proposed development does not give rise to any adverse highways, ecology, environmental, glint and glare or landscape character impacts. The proposed scheme accords with all local and national planning policy and as a significant source of renewable energy, the installation will contribute to achieving not only the sustainability goals of Portsmouth City Council as, that, as the applicant, but also the authority's objectives for the wider management of the impacts of climate change. 
Given that the availability of sites within the city for large-scale renewable and low-carbon energy generating, generating technology are limited, this site presents itself favourably. Many thanks for allowing us the opportunity to speak today and we very much hope the committee will agree with the case officer and choose to approve this application. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions, members? Just one, Judith. Um, um, does it include the IPM building? I, did, I saw the... I'm sorry, councillor, I'm not sure. The answer is yes. It does it include the IBM building? The answer is yes, is it? Well, IBM occupies several buildings there, but the answer is yes on all of them. Thank you. Any further questions? Should we move to comments then and move to recommendation? Darren? Darren, you've been called. You may speak. Uh, I move the officer recommendations. Um, it is another example of how this authority is taking the climate emergency seriously by installing solar panels on the site that it owns. Uh, I look forward to it helping uh, reduce carbon emissions and also reducing our costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that seconded? John, thank you very much indeed. Um, can I have, do we have any alternative proposals? If not, I'll move to um, us to vote to give this planning permission. Uh, all those in favour of giving planning permission, raise your hands. Okay, you have your planning permission. Thank you very much. Right, now we're going to move to um, deal with land at, no, well, the McDonald's restaurant, Portsmouth Road. Okay. Yep, McDonald's restaurant. That is in your pack at uh, page forty nine. Thank you very much. And uh, there is. Simon, would you like to go ahead? I don't think there's any smat to do any, any smat on this. No. Yes, there is. Page two, at the bottom of page two, there's a small, some more further additional information. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the uh, drive-through McDonald's at Portsmouth Road, Cosham. Uh, it has an application for various bits and pieces, but principally uh, a drive-through a lane and fast-forward booth, which I shall show to you in more detail. Just to locate everyone, um, just uh, to the south of Cosham Centre there, near the motorway. Um, we've got residential uh, properties to the immediate southeast and eastern boundary of the application site. Um, otherwise, it has an open field to the south and the, the main road there uh, to its northwestern side. top um, photograph shows the view from the street, looking at the um, area where the meals are paid for, the food is paid for and collected. So the paying is about there, um, and once you've paid, you move forward and collect your food about there. Um, and that is the whole uh, raison d'etre for the application. Should your food not quite be ready when you get to there, um, at the moment, you'd have to wait um, or be asked to drive away completely. And, uh, but if you don't, you, you, the car behind is stuck. Um, I don't believe that is a frequent uh, occurrence, but naturally the uh, applicant would wish to ensure the customer has the best possible experience every, each and every time. Uh, I was there on a Saturday uh, a week and a half ago, Saturday evening, 7.30 in the evening. I thought the, the, the roads in general in Portsmouth were busy. The site was busy, but it wasn't uh, tailing back onto the street or anything like that. It was, it was functioning uh, efficiently, it seemed to be, but they wished to uh, obviously ensure that on the presumably rare occasion there is a hold up, um, the whole site isn't held up. And they would do that by having a little lay by past the, uh, the, the held up vehicle. The lower first graph shows the, uh, the elevation to the car park where the customers can walk in on foot if that's how you want to pick up your food. Otherwise, you drive around. Uh, so there's the site. Um, 
So people uh, drive in, you either park up and walk in on foot, or you can drive around and there are two or three or four um, order booths there. You make your order, you drive around, you pay there, pick up there. And so the application is to have an extra lane here. There you are. So um, as you pick up from the booth here, if, you, if your food isn't quite ready, um, rather than blocking up, you would just move forward a little bit uh, and the car behind can pick up its food from the booth and drive around you on the new lane. So the booth is being extended here and some more extensions there in green underneath the canopy, the existing canopy uh, of the building, uh, minor extensions and they have internal rejigging so the actual dining area becomes slightly smaller and they've got more back of house area. Um, but the real issue is the uh, avoiding any potential even for uh, delays. Not much change at all, it's hard to discern really, but if I choose this elevation, this is the front elevation to the car park. At the moment there's the overhang of the roof you can see on either side and that's where the small areas will be infilled uh, on that elevation, the, si the side elevation and the two side elevations, sorry, in the front. So if you look at those two overhang canopies you'll see those disappear like that. So that's the infill there and there and along the front. Um, and then to go back to the SMAT, um, the application has been reduced in size since its submission. It started with some minor roof extensions. Those have disappeared now because they're infilling under the existing roof. So uh, we've just actually clarified with the applicant. So if approved or, or anything else, the development description will be need to be amended to uh, delete the words extension to roof line. Um, I think probably the last thing is there is a view So the green area there is where the escape lane would be effectively. So you would drive round the back of any car that's held up. Um, that's in front of that tree you can see uh, clearly in winter. That's it in summer. It's not the best tree in the world uh, in terms of form, um, but we'd like that replaced. So there's a condition to do that. It's, it's a well-maintained site, you can see, um, landscaped and, and, and clipped and so on. So, um, and there's space for a replacement tree elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Are there any questions about this application? Russell. You might mention this, but I want just to reiterate again. The, the little um, crossing where people go, is that, is that going to be moved? Then is that essentially, because, or essentially is it going to become a bigger crossing? Is the safety of people crossing there still going to be considered? <laughs> Uh, I haven't got the existing plan in front of me, councillor, so I don't know if it's been moved or not, but there's certainly, I think it might be, 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 yes, readjusted because of the, the escape lane. So they do need to make some adjustments, but clearly they've still got a proper, uh, proper crossing. And to follow up on that, is the, um, is, it, the, is the bin still going to be there? Uh, the only reason I say this is because this is not far from Hills End, and even though I wouldn't say I'm a regular, visitor to the McDonald's, I would say that um, there's a lot of rubbish. Um, so I hope that, if not an extra bin goes in, but I hope that the bin still stays where it is. Thank you. Yeah, a bin will be outside planning control as, as such a small structure, but um, uh, they may be watching and they may hear it and take that away and or be already be aware of the issue. Thank you. If there are no further questions, Darren. Just a just a couple, Simon. How many extra cars an hour are they estimating are going to come through here? I are don't they? think we've had that sort of data. I dare say they've got it, but um, I, I don't think they provided, nor did we ask for it, because uh, we didn't think it was a fundamental okay. uh, change. Uh, as I said at the start, I think it's just to remove the odd uh, okay. blockage, um, which would spoil, you know, but, I mentioned that because that's one of the main objections for people in Donaldson Road. The other thing is, with regards to the replacement tree, um, would the replacement tree be uh, of equivalence to what is there now, or would it just be a new sapling? That's in our gift, in, in our reasonable judgment. So. Um 
with all trees, you have to the, the, the bigger the tree is that you put in, it, the less likely, the harder it finds to adapt to its surroundings. Whereas the, the younger, uh, but it goes in bigger. If it does survive, um, it, it's bigger to start with. The younger, the, the smaller the tree you put in, as a general rule, I think, is more likely to adapt and so on. But we'll, we'll choose with tree advice the appropriate specimen in terms of location, uh, size, and species. Okay, well, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much. Are there further questions? If not, we'll move to comments and a recommendation. Gerald? Uh, uh, can I support the officer of recommendation? Is there a seconder for that, John? Thank you very much. Um, in the absence of any other suggestions, could you raise your hands if you want to give, approve this planning application? So we've granted planning applications subject to the conditions um, on the report. We'll now move to the... Uh, Chairman, I now have to go because I'm, I'm conflicted on this one. I'm just conscious that we've had several planning applications today where they've come to us because there are three objections. Nobody's come to speak here. No councillor has come to speak here. We've got a backlog that, uh, of planning applications. I understand the backlog, a lot of it is stuff waiting to come to the committee. And I, I really wonder whether we need to be looking again uh, whether three objections from members of the public trigger something coming to committee and it having to wait in a backlog for months and months and months or whether we need to be doing something different. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just really conscious today we've, we've, we've been going through some of these. The Cabinet uh, Member for uh, uh, Planning and Development has um, put forward a proposal to increase the number of um, public objections to five and it's currently um, being considered and needs to be considered by the Government's Gaudit, Government, Governance Audit and Standards Committee um, because um, it is a decision that needs to be looked at. But I don't think there'll be much delay in that and I agree with you that um, whilst we don't want to reduce the opportunity of the public to uh, comment, um, we do want to try and see if five is a satisfactory compromise in this case. Right, can I move to Flathouse Key then? Thank you. Uh, uh, you're, I'll let you leave in your own time. Councillor. Um, Simon, could you introduce the application for land at Flathouse Key? There is a SMAT on page two, and the application is on page 37. 37. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. This is an application for a concrete and batching plant at Flathouse, Flathouse Key Circular Road in the commercial port. Just to locate members and the other viewers, uh, there it is circled unscientifically there with a green line, um, so not far from the end of the, the A3 and motorway um, in the commercial port with access to the main roads and indeed of course to the port bit more detail there. Um, a lot of the, the site and surrounding has been cleared since this, uh, this Google aerial photograph, um, but that's the site outlined in green. There is the official application site edged in red. Um, so you have uh, the aggregate plant, the silos, the conveyors, the sorters, the storage, etc. on the southern side, which is the structures, you'll see it in a bit more detail in a moment, and with some parking to the northern side and obviously working space, manoeuvring, etc., and then the red edge link to the public highway. And members will have seen in the report the applicant owns the blue edged land, or well, the, the, yes, the applicant, um, or leases it from the City Council, uh, and this is their aggregates plant that was approved by this committee at the start of the year, and there is a Symbiosis, of course, between aggregates and concrete, with the concrete batching using aggregates from uh, the plant. Here are some of the elevations. Top elevation is the western elevation, then the east and the southern elevation. So there's a collection of different uh, structures there, silos, uh, belts, sorting, storage etc. Industrial plant there for, for 
the receipt and processing of materials in order to produce uh, concrete. So as the report uh, explains, um, it's part of the commercial area of the port with import and export and handling and processing of goods and cargoes. Um, much of it, of course, coming in by sea uh, and going on to its destinations, or in this case being processed and then going on to its destination in the local area. The applicant uh, is a nationwide uh, supply of concrete uh, and aggregates, but um, clearly uh, has a new en endeavour business venture here at the site with the aggregates plant already approved and the proposed concrete plant next to it, and they would work together indeed. Um, so really that is the long and short of it. Um, range of consultee replies with respect to uh, highways uh, and drainage and contamination and, and so on. Um, nothing difficult arising from those. And then lastly, oh yes, the update uh, from Hampshire Minerals and Waste. Uh, Hampshire, the County Council have replied, confirming that the application complies with the policies of the Minerals and Waste Plan. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? In the absence of anybody else having a question, I'd like you to explain to us a little bit more, please, the noise about the noise assessment and why it's been decided that uh, the operation could happen 724 rather than the more conventional conditions we put on to limit the times, which could, I mean, I, I'm just worried about sort of people living near being subject to, albeit a low level, endless grinding noise. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, uh, on the recommendation of um, environmental services, um, the operating hour, hours are restricted by Condition 8 to 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily, um, notwithstanding it's some distance away from near residences, but nevertheless, those were the recommended hours. And, and do you, what, what is, what's your opinion of the uh, noise assessment? Um, for the rest, I'm glad to hear that that's going to be restricted. D do you think noise for the times between uh, um, 11 and 7 the next morning, uh, uh, the, between 7 and 11 during the day, will be um, adverse for people's health or anything? Uh, no, um, regulatory services, uh, what, what, and if with any noise uh, assessment, um, it's not just the noise, of course, from the proposed development, but also the contextual noise and how much the noise from the proposal may be masked and therefore not noticed because of other noise. Of course, between the residential, the nearest residential and the application site is the, all the road network. So all the background noise there during the day of cars plus all the other activities at the port um, so that's why during the day to answer your question um, clearly regulatory services were were happy that there wouldn't be any adverse undue adverse effect uh, upon neighbors thank you very much uh, if there are no other questions should, should we move to comments and uh, recommendations please members Darren I propose moving the officers recommendation it's another good example of someone investing in our city and they should be welcomed Thank you very much. You second that, Russell, do you? We have a proposer and a seconder then to uh, grant planning permissions that's subject to the uh, report here. Could, you, could I ask you to raise your hands if you want to um, give planning permission for this development? Unanimously, we've agreed to give planning permission. Um, I think uh, that's the end of this planning committee. I'd like to thank you all very much for your contributions and help today and look forward to our next uh, committee, which I think is in three or four weeks. Thank you all very much.